Welcome to Fiction Narratives. Chapter 41, Alan Walker. It happened in an instant, Alan appeared in an enormous blank space, one that was familiar to him. This place. Gojo Sensei. Alan couldn't think of any other possibility than the system bringing him to this place. Unfortunately, I'm not Satoru Gojo, brat. A chilling voice of a man came from behind Alan, leaving him paralyzed and with a cold sweat on his back. Alan could maintain his composure in the face of Hulk's absurd power because it was neutral. But the vicious, bloody, and evil aura to the core was different, Alan felt as if he were stepping on decaying corpses just by being close. Sukuna. Alan turned around as the endless space turned black and red, Alan saw a man, if you could call him that, he had four arms, two pairs of eyes, black line tattoos, and pink hair combed backward. No, that appearance is Ryaman Sukuna's. Does it matter he he, so it's you Sukuna smiled cruelly, showing his teeth. You're the kid who wants to use my power. System. Host, you were in danger, so I took the liberty of calling him because the crimson chest had his set of skills. For the current Alan, when he opens a crimson chest, two possibilities can occur. First, he gets something he can't use, and second, that something is uncontrollable and ends up hurting him. This is mainly because Alan isn't at the level to assimilate a crimson chest on his own at this moment. As mentioned earlier, he shouldn't be able to get them. However, as in life, there's more than one path to the goal, even if that path is cheating in the gotcha. Alan Walker acquired Sukuna's powers and techniques. However, they are useless without extensive and patient training. Unfortunately, Alan is in danger. Who better to teach him how to use Sukuna's abilities than the original owner but life isn't that simple, the abilities belong to Alan, that's true, and Sukuna can't do anything about it. But at the same time, he has no obligation to teach Alan. In Gojo's case, he did it voluntarily. What don't look at me like I'm an enemy to defeat. I can't even affect this place, you, or your world. Instead of relaxing, Alan increased his caution. Sukuna had been too calm and reasonable for a while now, even cordial. This made Alan's skin crawl. You want to learn to use my power, right I don't care to teach you, but unlike Satoru Gojo, I won't do it for free. Sukuna smiled as he saw Alan sharpening his gaze. Don't get nervous. It's not a big deal. Equals equals equals. Alan's POV. When was it when did I start having the same dream it must have been since I can remember, maybe at two or three years old. In my dream, there was a white, mountainous landscape, with dry trees, a grey sky full of clouds, and the sound of a cold blizzard blowing snow everywhere. There was always a young man covered by a white cloak walking somewhere, there was a strong snowstorm, so seeing someone in that situation must have been absurd, but there he was, walking while enduring the wind. He often stumbled but would get up again and keep walking. Why did he do that where was he going I could never find the answer. Sometimes I wanted to ask him, but my voice never reached him. Sometimes I wanted to get closer, but what seemed to be a few meters were unreachable for me, no matter how much I walked towards him. I could only watch him walk under the storm, it was as if something whispered to him to keep moving forward with every step, perhaps a promise or a curse. His breath occasionally escaped his mouth, and I could hear his faint complaint of fatigue and pain, but he kept walking. Then, I woke up as a young child, sat on my bed, and looked at the horizon through the window, and the sky was grey. It was always grey for me, no matter if it was clear. Equals equals equals. Alan's blood froze upon hearing Sukuna's sickening request. Alan understood it, no matter how friendly he seemed, Sukuna was still the same sadistic fiend as always. Host, I'll return you immediately. No. You're not thinking of accepting if I had known this outcome, I wouldn't have called him. Don't worry. Alan looked at Sukuna with disdain. But will you be useful not to offend, but I don't think you're more powerful than all my other abilities combined. Ha 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 ha, does my request bother you you're stupid, kid. In the end, you only have pieces of separate powers, no matter how well you use them, they're still just pieces of something. Sukuna narrowed his eyes. Besides, what you need right now isn't power, it's pure knowledge and skill. Sukuna was right, 
trying to compete with power against a monster that increases in power every second is ridiculous. Alan needed more than power to stop Hulk. Fun. Ha 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 ha. Sukuna laughed with joy while looking at Alan. At that moment, Alan's eyes locked onto Sukuna, and in an instant, Crown Clown surrounded him with sticks. But if you break your promise, I'll kill you myself. Sukuna stopped laughing and looked at Alan indifferently. It's unnecessary, kid. Let's make a binding vow. It was unnatural how Sukuna could go from laughing insanely to being as expressionless as a sociopath. Equals equals equals. Alan's POV. Since I can remember, everything was gray. Not in a metaphorical sense, I was unable to see colors. My parents noticed it and took me to the hospital. After several tests and examinations, they discovered my condition. Mrs. Walker, your son has achromatopsia, a very rare genetic condition that makes him see only in gray tones or in black and white. The doctor sighed while handing me a lollipop, I suppose it was a habit or something, I didn't refuse it because I always liked sweets. Is there a cure my mom asked while holding my hand tighter. I remember that moment, my mom was a woman with hair as white as snow, silver eyes, and beautiful features, she looked worriedly at the doctor. There's no cure, but there are some advancements in. The doctor started discussing complicated matters, and I remember losing interest and diving into my world. That day they bought me a lot of ice cream, that I remember. Arriving home, my mother started crying, and my father comforted her. I also held her hand, and she hugged me. At that moment, I wasn't sure why she was crying, I would have liked to tell her that not seeing colors didn't bother me. From my perspective, my condition didn't mean much because having never experienced colors, I didn't feel their loss. Alan opened his eyes and found himself in the middle of a rural town in Japan. He began walking while observing the cheerful people all around. Alan felt an immense amount of regret but decided to kill his emotions. He moved through the crowd and reached a blacksmith's shop. Inside, he was greeted by a kind old man who welcomed him while showcasing all his products. With a dark look, Alan took one of the katanas, a beautiful katana with a red sheath. Alan unsheathed the sword. You have a good eye, that's... At the old man stopped speaking as he looked in horror at Alan's outstretched hand holding the katana. The old man followed the blade's edge, terrified as it cut through his neck. W.Y. he asked in disbelief. Alan's gaze wasn't any better than the old man's. There was despair as he felt his hand severing the old man's neck, disgust, and revulsion as the metal blade became lodged in the cervical. Alan responded, no, he couldn't respond because it wasn't his body. The deal, the cruel deal, the unpleasant, inhumane, and repulsive deal that Alan made with Sukuna was that he must experience, firsthand, all the death Sukuna had caused. Alan couldn't even close his eyes as he finished cutting the old man's neck, and his head rolled away in disbelief and agony. Sukuna could have decapitated him instantly, but he wanted to take his time. Drops of blood fell down Alan's face. How does it feel Sukuna's voice echoed in his mind. How does it feel to kill without reason how does the sensation of cutting through blood feel ha 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 ha, tell me, Alan. Can you feel the lingering heat it's intoxicating. Shut up. Alan gave Sukuna a firm look. Sukuna fell silent. Don't worry. This is just the beginning. Alan Sukuna ran out of the shop, grabbed a woman by the head, and twisted her neck as people began to scream. No. Alan seized a terrified man and with inhuman strength, ripped him in half, blood and guts flew everywhere. Alan felt like vomiting, but he was incapable, he was merely a spectator, but he could feel, smell, and hear everything. A group of samurais arrived and surrounded him. Alan vanished and buried his fist in one man, then ripped out his heart and crushed it in front of him. The warriors screamed while Alan Sukuna sadistically laughed, grabbed one of the samurais, and struck the ground so hard that the man exploded, bits of flesh and pulverized bones scattered everywhere. A man attempted to strike him, but Alan grabbed the katana, broke it, and sliced his stomach, the samurai looked in despair as his organs fell to the ground. The massacre had just begun, and Alan could only see the blood and flesh, and hear the agonizing screams of people being slaughtered in many ways. Sukuna showed no mercy, men, women, children, elders, animals, 
everything in his path turned into victims of brutal and bloody murder. It almost seemed like some sort of personal challenge to kill cruelly, and meanwhile, Sukuna looked with delight at Alan's face of powerlessness. Equals equals equals. Alan's POV. Since I can remember, there has always been a melody in my head. A slow, beautiful yet sad piano melody. At first, I was too young to know what that music was, even though it was bothersome to hear, I never despaired, thinking it was normal for everyone to hear music. My mother didn't think so, and she took me to the doctor. I could see how tired her face looked, I'm sorry, I wished I were an easier child to raise. My son often sits playing alone for hours. Hardly speaks even though he's three. I'm afraid young Alan is autistic. The doctor said sorrowfully, looking at my mother. I didn't know what that was at that time. No why do only these things happen to him my mother cried again, and I didn't like seeing her like that, so I hugged her without saying anything. She returned the hug with love. I'm sorry, Alan. Mom doesn't want you to see her like this, I promise everything will be okay. At that time, I didn't understand, but I've always been a sickly child and often went to the hospital for something, to which my special conditions were added. I always felt the urge to apologize to my parents for causing them so much trouble. But I didn't get a chance before they died. Days passed, perhaps months, as blood flowed like rivers beneath Alan, he didn't know how many people he had killed. Alan seemed like a lifeless specter wandering in a tattered, blood-soaked yukata through ancient Japan. Alan Sukuna killed civilians and sorcerers, killed curses, and killed everything alike. Alan experienced a series of brutal and profane murders. But why was all this happening finally, Alan approached a girl on the shore of a lake. She wore humble clothes and seemed to be picking up some branches. Alan, who had been silent for some time, seemed to react upon seeing her because she resembled his late mother greatly. The girl had white hair, kind eyes, and a pleasant smile. Sukuna only watched with a wide smile as Alan acted. Sukuna. Stop. This ends now. Oh after so many people, after coming so close, you give up on a little girl, do you have a weakness for people with that hair color? Ryaman Sukuna, I'll kill you. Ha 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 ha, that's the damn attitude. Fine, I'll cancel the memory synchronization after you finish with her. Damned, I'll kill you. Ha 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 ha. Alan approached and received a confused look from the girl. Wait. Please. Stop. Alan's words seemed to rip his throat. Alan's POV. A year passed. After being diagnosed with autism, my mom prepared an activity for us every day, although, at that time, I loved being alone and wanted to refuse, I hated seeing her cry, so I complied with her requests. Alan, let's go play in the yard. I didn't like going to the yard. But I went with her. Alan, look, it's a balloon. I didn't like balloons. But I took care of it for a week until it popped. Alan, let's go for a walk. I didn't like walking outside. But I held her hand and walked with her for hours. I like spending time with her. More than I believed. The wall between the world and me slowly started to disappear. One day I woke up to the sound of a piano. It wasn't the sad melody that repeated in my head, it was a beautiful, cheerful melody. I rushed downstairs. And then I saw her. The sunlight streamed through the window, illuminating the room. My mother swayed back and forth with a dazzling smile while her fingers played the cheerful melody. The morning breeze came in through the window, moving her hair. She wore a yellow dress that matched the sunlight. At that moment, I was mesmerized. I hadn't known beauty until that moment, and without realizing it, I could see the first color. Tears streamed from my eyes. My mother looked at me with a smile and gestured for me to come closer. I always thought my mom's eyes were completely silver, but it wasn't true, at that moment, I noticed they had a faint mix of violet. As I approached her, instead of my usual tepid response, I jumped into her arms. My mother was surprised. I think I can see color. I said in a low voice. My mother froze and immediately cried while hugging me. Alan, mom loves you no matter how you are, but I'm so happy. Equals equals equals. Alan's hands were about to reach the girl's neck, but they stopped. What Sukuna's laughter halted. 
Alan caressed the little girl's head and smiled at her. Go home, it's dangerous to wander in the forest alone. Okay. The embarrassed girl nodded and ran away. You're disgusting. Probably the most repulsive thing I've ever encountered. Alan Walker. Sukuna's face was ugly as if he had eaten garbage. Alan smiled mockingly at Sukuna. It's unflattery to be disgusting for you. Sukuna felt apprehensive towards Alan. Something he had never felt before. Chapter 42, The Power Is Not Everything When people undergo desperate and hopeless situations, they tend to seek refuge in their memories, desires, yearnings, fantasies, or illusions. This was the case for Alan when subjected to unimaginable psychological torture, he took refuge in his past. In the end, this saved him, even when he was about to break, the memory of his deceased mother protected him and accomplished something impossible, altering the false memory Sukuna had given him. Why would Sukuna do something as despicable as that the answer is crueler than you think? It's that there's no reason. Sukuna simply wanted to do it, that's how selfish, sadistic, and cruel Ryaman Sukuna is. Sukuna laughed at Alan, ridiculed Alan, and had fun with Alan, it's not that he hated him, he just wanted to mentally break him. Of course, due to the binding pact between them, Sukuna would be obliged to teach Alan how to use the set of skills he gained from him, but Sukuna didn't care about that. Sukuna watched with a macabre smile as Alan slowly lost his mind, and it seemed as if everything had ended according to his plan. But. Sukuna's POV. The first thing I thought when I saw him was of Satoru Gojo, but right after that, I realized they were different, both in personality and essence. I can respect someone like Satoru Gojo, even his essence and way of being. But seeing the white-haired brat, something displeased me. Something made me feel a lot of disgust. And as always, I simply decided to destroy him. I soon realized I couldn't kill him in this place. It's a pity. No, wait, maybe I can't kill him, but what if? Ha 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 ha. I've come up with a way to hurt him to the point of breakdown, ha ha ha. Death and blood. Death and entrails. Death and destruction. Death and pain. Much pain. Let the rivers be dyed red. Let Alan witness the worst possible nightmare. Let him kill thousands, no, hundreds of thousands with his own hands. Let him taste the flavor of fresh blood. Let him fall into the most viscous despair. Let the corpses be profaned before him. Children, women, elders, healthy and sick alike. And then. Everything happened just as I predicted, so much that it was even boring. Or so I thought until. Oh that girl is that your weakness if it were, you should have gone mad earlier. Is it because she resembles someone well, I finally have you, brat. What did he stop why how I should have control over everything that happens. The brat caressed the girl's head, and she left. Then he looked at me. And a POV. Sukuna looked through Alan's eyes and couldn't find any madness or despair. There was no corruption. Or stain. After living in blood and death in a massive amount capable of driving everyone else mad, Alan's eyes remained as they were at the beginning. Sukuna felt uncomfortable. Felt annoyed, felt disgusted seeing Alan, you're the most disgusting thing I've ever met, Alan Walker. Sukuna felt like cursing but quickly controlled himself. You win. Alan opened his eyes in surprise at Sukuna admitting defeat, even knowing that he was bound by the binding vow. Alan didn't believe that the king of curses would keep his promise. Sukuna shifted from forearms to his two-arm version, cracked his neck, and looked at Alan indifferently. Brat, you're the most wasteful bastard I've seen, it's time you learned some control. Equals equals equals. As everyone's breath was taken away by the moment Hulk was about to strike Alan, Young Walker clasped his hands with the middle and ring fingers straightened and the index and little fingers of both hands closed parallelly. Malevolent Kitchen Time slowed down as Alan's domain expansion appeared. Domain expansion, an act against the laws of the world, an act where a sorcerer selfishly, arbitrarily, and profanely declares ownership of a place, imposing their rules and nullifying the world's laws. In Sukuna's case, the act is even more profane because he doesn't confine his domain to a separate space, he unfolds it shamelessly as if saying, this place belongs to me, and no one can stop it. The air changed, anticipating the next move. However, 
there was someone who didn't care, and that was Hulk, chaos and destruction still surrounded him. Standing at a short distance, Hulk raised both hands like a hammer to crush Alan. The world turned black and red as a gruesome Buddhist shrine appeared not far from Alan. Unlike Sukuna's domain, Alan's version didn't have bones as an adornment, yet it was still eerie. Hulk was about to strike Alan, as many screamed in fear at seeing this, but unexpectedly, one of Hulk's arms detached. This left everyone in shock. Sukuna's domain expansion overwhelms his opponent with countless attacks of dismantling and cleave, which are Sukuna's most frequently used techniques. Alan smiled slightly, but his eyes didn't show happiness or mockery, he seemed more serene at this moment. Considering what happened to gain this power, it's already a miracle that he didn't need therapy. Ruoar Ruoar. Hulk roared as his arm regenerated. Alan tilted his head in response, and Hulk split into pieces. While the onlookers discussed what had happened with disbelief and hope, Alan unpleasantly recalled his interactions with Sukuna while he taught him to use his cursed technique. Sukuna, first, stop thinking that large-scale destruction is an indicator of power, sure it is, but it's not the only form of power, brat. Alan felt uneasy realizing that Sukuna was a better teacher than Gojo. It's unpleasant, but this is because Gojo, being a complete genius, can hardly explain to others how he does things. Luckily, when Gojo taught Alan, he was able to understand most of his teachings due to his own talent. Or perhaps past experience, but it's frustrating that, on the other hand, Sukuna's overwhelming knowledge and high intellect, capable of even copying curse techniques from others, make him a better teacher when it comes to teaching. Alan cursed internally but accepted all the knowledge and skills that Sukuna taught him. Alan vanished to appear in front of Hulk, while the green monster regenerated, in an instant, both actions were completed, and Alan appeared with a hand in Hulk's abdomen. Hulk screamed, shaking the very space itself, as he prepared to strike again. He was even more furious with Alan for hurting him again and showed it by increasing his power even more. At this point, Alan was no longer able to compete against Hulk head-on. Sukuna, despicable brat, it's not important to have more destructive power than your opponent, but to know how to nullify, influence, deflect, seal, or corrupt their power. Hulk screamed, but his voice was immediately interrupted as Alan's malevolent kitchen cut him into pieces again. Alan furrowed his brow as he felt how Hulk's gamma radiation behaved within his body, Hulk regenerated even faster as his power increased. This is too erratic. Alan thought, confused, as endless cuts overwhelmed Hulk, turning him into minced meat only for him to regenerate even faster. Sukuna, make ignorance your enemy, even if you are stronger than the other party, find out how your opponent's power works to develop an effective measure. Alan felt the urge to kill Sukuna the moment he heard that because he remembered that Sukuna had cut Gojo in half. Alan withdrew while allowing more and more cuts to attack Hulk. Alan looked at his hand and couldn't understand how it had become that monster, Hulk looked nothing like the one he had seen on the news days ago, so Alan decided to try again. But at that moment, Hulk appeared by his side and grabbed Alan by the neck. Hulk's overwhelming strength almost crushed his neck, but Alan freed himself using Haki of the King. Is this for real Alan dodged death, he was taken by surprise, although he was only momentarily distracted. Hulk landed on the ground and screamed as the gamma radiation formed a solid energy sphere around him, absurdly blocking Alan's domain. This. Alan observed this from the sky. Thinking about how Savage Hulk resisted universal destruction, it's not too crazy to think that a domain is not impossible for Hulk to withstand. But. A drop of sweat fell down Alan's cheek as a smile formed. This is too much cheating, isn't it? Did something happen to Alan? Of course, something happened. Can't you see the super powerful and immortal ogre trying to kill him? I don't mean that, he looks more serene than before, even though Hulk keeps increasing his power uncontrollably. Equals equals equals. Dismantle and cleave cut continuously and so rapidly that it seemed like the ground was disintegrating, but that didn't matter to the monster, who kept advancing towards Alan, covered in gamma radiation. Alan extended his hand, and a broad blade sword formed in his hand, with a cross engraved on the blade. However, don't be mistaken, it didn't have any sacred power or anything like that. Sukuna, what a disgraceful bastard, 
you're so useless that you don't even bother to understand your powers, you just look for a new one every time things get complicated. Look at that thing in your hand. Are you even using it pathetic? Shut up, Sukuna. Even if it was just a memory, Alan responded to his memory with annoyance. It was frustrating for him to be scolded by Sukuna's scum. But the most unbearable thing for Alan was that Sukuna was right, he hadn't even learned to use everything he already had and was seeking more power. Innocence. Breaking the critical point. Crown Saber. Murmured Alan. Originally, that sword was created to cut evil, but that was nothing more than the desire of a kind-hearted young man. This Alan wanted something different. Hulk attacked and Alan coated the sword with cursed energy. Sukuna, you disgust me. How dare you insult Satoru Gojo by using his techniques with such poor control of cursed energy are you underestimating sorcerers, brat? Alan gritted his teeth, and the sword acquired a green aura from the cursed energy. Then Alan used Conqueror's Haki at the same time. Three incompatible energies but in harmony danced on the blade of the sword. Haki cleave. Alan said, lowering the sword. Hulk was split in half, including his gamma radiation. Huh. Hulk regenerated again, but Alan noticed something that made him erupt in anger. Fury. Are you seeing this use your satellites or whatever to track where Hulk came from? This abnormal state of Hulk was caused by someone else. Alan dodged Hulk's blow, and Hulk fell to the ground, destroying a large portion of the surface and shaking the United States. Commander Hill. Fury shouted furiously. What kind of psychopath would create a monster that puts the whole world in danger without needing orders, she understood and began tracking Hulk's origin. With s.h.i.e.l.ds resources, it was only a matter of time before they found Ross. General, your orders. Ra silently stared at the screen. During the fight, he was surprised by the level of destruction caused. But like a madman far from repenting, he only shouted in fury, saying he was right, and Hulk was a danger not only to the country but to the world. He immediately called the White House to suggest the use of nuclear weapons against Hulk, and he's currently waiting. What do you mean we are the United States Army, Fury want trouble nonsense? But won't they find out that it was all caused by us? The sergeant shivered as he looked into Ross's cruel eyes. Ross directed his gaze to a woman in a lab coat. How is the Red Hulk project going? Ross would never admit that he was wrong, and he would never regret his actions. For him, everything he did was for the good of the country, and everything was justified. The Red Hulk project has some problems, but. It will be complete soon, sir, the nervous woman replied. These men and women were loyal to Ross because his figure as a general had always been respected. However, now they realized what General Thaddeus Ross was capable of. The one who roars while destroying everything might be Hulk, but the real monster is Ross. Alan took a deep breath, suppressing his anger, for now, he knew what to do against Hulk. You absorbed that gamma radiation for some reason Alan leaned back as the green fist passed over his head, behind Alan, a shockwave traveled dozens of miles, laying waste to everything in its path. The important thing with Cleave is knowing what to divide, Alan had been attacking the wrong place all this time. Sukuna, once you discover the source of your opponent's strength, then comes the fun part, crushing them in the most overwhelming way possible ha 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 ha. Alan gripped the crown saber in his hand and cut Hulk, but this time the flesh was not cut, however, something absolutely impossible happened. Ugh. Hulk complained about the monster that could be disintegrated without showing the slightest pain for the first time. Felt Pain Chapter 43, The Path of Sukuna or The abnormally large sword cut through Hulk, ignoring his defense. Hulk felt pain, but more than anything, he felt discomfort, as this time something was cut that wasn't flesh. The massive energy coursing through his body was split in half, like stepping on a hose and cutting off the water flow. In a single move, Alan struck Hulk's abdomen with his left hand, and from behind the giant green figure, a huge wave of green energy dispersed into the air. The gamma radiation that turned you into this version wasn't originally yours, so like two pieces of fabric sewn together, it's not fully assimilated. I can separate it and expel it from your body. Hulk attempted to attack, but Alan's domain attack severed his arms. Alan combined his conqueror's hacky with his malevolent kitchen, 
and the endless cuts increased his power to pierce through Hulk's impenetrable defense. Hulk couldn't move, and immediately Alan's sword cut Hulk's green energy once more. Crown Saber severed the gamma radiation, and malevolent kitchen cut through Hulk's body. This series of attacks overwhelmed the monster, rendering him helpless, every second, waves of green energy dispersed through a combination of sword and fist strikes by Alan. Hulk crossed his arms to defend himself, but the sword pierced through, expelling gamma radiation from within him. Hulk screamed in annoyance, feeling weakened. He clapped his hands, creating a devastating shockwave that hit Alan. Alan felt his organs shift upon receiving the shockwave, but he was enveloped in his innocence and protected by Haki. As he emerged, Alan found Hulk's foot about to fall on him. Alan turned, letting the stomp hit the ground, a nearby mountain split in half. The cuts from Malevolent Kitchen continued relentlessly on Hulk. Alan stood expressionless as Hulk used his giant fist in front of him. Just as Hulk was about to kill Alan, his arm was severed into pieces. Alan grabbed Hulk's face and smashed it into the ground, relentlessly cutting him with crown saber, forming a massive cut mark on the ground. Everyone could see with joy how Hulk's glow dimmed every moment, and the fluorescent veins grew thinner. Hulk grabbed Alan's hand, snatched crown saber from him, and threw it away. The weakness and pain caused by the sword were so intense that even Hulk tried to get rid of it in a moment of lucidity and reasoning. However, Alan smiled at seeing this, without stopping him. It's too late. Hulk attempted to attack now that the dangerous sword was gone, but Alan extended his hand. Cleave. Extinguish. Hulk felt more fatigued as one of his arms dried up like a twig. Like Sukuna replicating Maharaga's adaptation against Gojo's infinity, like Sukuna modifying Cleave and creating the web he used against Kashimo, Alan was also capable of altering his cursed technique to change its nature. He copied the way Crown Saber cut gamma radiation and added it to his malevolent kitchen. Now, Hulk couldn't block the cuts anymore. Alan withdrew as Hulk growled, and his arm returned to its original size. However, the fight was decided. Alan looked pityingly at Hulk, but he showed no mercy, his domain increased in intensity, thousands of cuts attacked Hulk every second, dehydrating his body as if draining him. <laughs> Hulk's scream echoed for dozens of miles around, but this time, it contained pain and anguish mixed with his fury. Hulk's rage is infinite, and consequently, his strength is too, but even faster than Hulk's rage, Alan's domain weakened him. To cut the gamma radiation itself that's a brilliant idea. Wednesday's calm voice reached Alan's mind, he looked at his shoulder, and a small doll appeared there. She couldn't speak directly because people might hear her. Speaking of the spectators, they were in shock seeing Hulk being attacked by endless cuts, yet he seemed like an absurdly immortal monster because he kept regenerating. Alan knows she can come and go from his inventory at will, teleporting to wherever he is, no matter if it's in another world. This strange phenomenon remains a huge mystery to Alan. He has wondered more than once if all sex dolls are like that. Wednesday was a normal girl before coming to this world, but what about those who have abilities powers or magic? Could they use that power in this world are you going to kill him the girl whispered. Alan smiled. There's that possibility. I don't want to, but if I can't decrease his strength enough to return him to normal, will I have to kill him? From my point of view, I think you should end him now that you can. However, you'll regret it someday. After all, Hulk is just a victim, and killing an innocent person is an overwhelming burden. For someone like you. I know. Alan smiled, but Wednesday glanced at him, sensing something was wrong. A disagreeable fake smile. Wednesday thought, feeling a strange painful emotion in her chest. Wednesday disappeared again, leaving Alan thinking. His emotions had numbed after experiencing hell with Sukuna, but he was still the same, and when his mind cleared, he might regret killing Hulk. I would have liked you to be truly evil. Alan smiled ironically, hearing his own hypocritical thoughts. If Hulk were truly evil, would he feel okay about killing him? Alan observed Hulk trying unsuccessfully to withstand the attacks of his domain. No other way, I'll push a little harder. Alan disappeared. Hulk, your power is artificial. Since that gamma radiation isn't yours, it's not fully assimilated by you. It's like seeing a huge rope held together in the middle by a knot, 
being imperfect makes it possible to separate. Hacky. Alan placed his hand on Hulk's head, and immediately, a larger invisible cut expelled a massive amount of gamma radiation from within Hulk. The screen lit up, blinding all spectators and swallowing Alan's figure, the system interrupted the live broadcast at Alan's request. Alan lay on the ground exhausted, he used too much cursed energy expelling that gamma radiation from Hulk. What they say is true, it's harder to save someone than to kill them, don't you think so, Hulk? Hulk sat in front of Alan, now smaller, less than 3 meters, but still big. Did it work even Alan himself was surprised that it worked. Why help Hulk Hulk does many bad things. Said Hulk, sitting there dejected. Hulk tired of running. Everyone hate Hulk for existing. But have a point, Hulk be danger. Weapons are dangerous, and everyone has them. The president has a button to destroy the world in his cabinet. The danger is relative, Alan replied. But I'm mad at you for almost killing me. But then why help Hulk Hulk looked at Alan, confused. Who knows? At least I think you didn't deserve to die if it was never your intention to act this way. And I didn't want to be like him, Alan recalled Sukuna's last words. Sukuna, well, I taught you everything. Now let's see how long it takes for you to be like me, Alan Walker. Ha 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 ha. I'll never be like him. Alan stood up and offered his hand to Hulk. Would you like to stop running, Hulk? What Hulk looked at Alan's hand, not knowing what it meant. Alan smiled. It's called greeting. Hulk greeting. Hulk happily grabbed Alan's hand tightly. Dot just don't use so much force when greeting others, Alan replied with the same smile while activating the reverse technique. Equals equals equals. Back in New Mexico. Alan looked at Agent Carlson, who had been blown away in a bubble at the beginning of the fight. So. You put a seal on Hulk that prevents him from transforming into that world-destroying thing, but it'll break if Hulk gets too angry, so we can't capture him. Phil looked at Alan skeptically. Yeah, that's basically it. Shrugged Alan. Hulk feels it, Hulk behaves badly, Hulk bowed as Alan had taught him. Equals equals equals. That's a lie, straight face. That's a lie more fake than my father saying he's only going to the store for milk, lol. Cap Allen, it's not okay to tell lies, or at least put more effort into it, d, equals equals equals. Phil didn't believe it either, but as he was about to respond, he received a call from Fury. After accepting his new orders, he observed Hulk. General Ross has been arrested and will face a court-martial, Carlson observed Hulk's reaction. Ross. Hulk smash. Hulk shouted as veins on his body bulged, Phil put his hand on his pistol. Hulk. Alan called the big green guy, and he immediately calmed down. Feel it? Hulk apologized to Carlson. It seems he can control himself, Carlson sighed. Besides, S.H.I.E.L.D. will take care of the people affected by gamma radiation. We don't know if we can reverse the mutation, but it's better than a hospital. Good people give food to Hulk, help them. Carlson felt strange seeing Hulk and comparing him to the monster from earlier, they were so different. This one seemed like a child learning to speak. Technically, he's only two weeks old. Alan added, feeling exhausted, it had been a lot and he was somewhat tired. I don't know how to feel about this outcome. Obviously angry. That thing almost destroyed the world, it shouldn't end like this. Someone arrest him. Arrest him and where would you lock him up nothing can contain him if he turns into World Breaker Hulk again. Gwen, remember Alan said that state was artificial, so Hulk isn't entirely to blame. Also, the news says nobody died. Don't be naive, that was thanks to Alan containing the damage. MJ, precisely, trust his judgment and decision. Wait, I just realized, did our otaku save the world Gwen, yes. The crowd quieted down. Despite dissatisfaction with how Hulk was being treated, they had to accept that Alan had saved the world. Equals equals equals. Host, zero confirmed casualties, only material damage thanks to you. Also, the campers you covered with your innocence in that valley have all been rescued. I see. Alan didn't react much to that news, his main wish was not to kill innocents. Of course, people's deaths bothered him, 
but only to the level of a normal person feeling empathy and pity for them. During the live stream, viewers exceeded 3 million, but half of them are starting to leave after the fight ended. Alan didn't react to those numbers. It was normal given the danger caused by Hulk, and it would have been more, but people didn't find out in time. Alan simply shrugged, he knew that most viewers wouldn't return for the next live stream. Still, he had to deal with a million people because Alan had confirmed that he was an Omega level mutant, and possibly, DC was something real. Phil stared ahead with empty eyes, behind him were a young man and a green monster, all three riding a three seat bicycle. Why Carlson yelled as he cursed his life. Why are we on this damn bike again? No, this one's different, Phil, it's very sturdy and has three seats replied Alan maliciously. Are we seriously back to normal, confused face, ha ha ha, poor Carlson. Give that man a raise, LMAO. Rick, that's the magic of Marvel, one moment you're facing an apocalypse, and the next, you're having shawarma with friends. Rick 137, what's Marvel Rick? Your underdeveloped brain doesn't need to know. System, play suitable BGM for a road trip. At your service, life is a highway. The music started playing out of nowhere, surprising Carlson and Hulk. Carlson looked at Alan's smile behind him. Don't you dare, Walker. Carlson threatened with a dark face. Fun. Alan smiled widely, his eyes laughing. Life's like a road that you travel on. When there's one day here, and the next day gone. Sometimes you bend, sometimes you stand, sometimes you turn your back to the wind. Ha ha ha, Hulk likes the song. Hulk started to follow the rhythm. Come on, Carlson, don't be a killjoy, life is short, just sing life is a highway Alan got a microphone. Through all these cities and all these towns. It's in my blood, and it's all around. I love you now like I loved you then. This is the road, and these are the hands. From Mozambique to those Memphis nights. The Khyber Pass to Vancouver's lights. Knock me down and back up again. You're in my blood, I'm not a lonely man. Hulk likes it. Life Highway. While Alan and Hulk sang in the back seats, Philip Carlson was having an existential crisis. These two had been fighting each other and nearly destroyed the world in the process, but now they seemed like a pair of crazy friends. And to make it worse, Phil was back on the dreadful bicycle. Phil turned to Alan furiously, enough is enough. We're just taking it to Puente Antigua. Come on, Phil, you know I have to fulfill the challenge, Alan shrugged, making the microphone disappear from his hand. Hey, you're still on about that Philip wanted to throw himself off a cliff. You were nearly killed, you shouldn't be bothered anymore. Phil couldn't understand how Alan could still be concerned about the outcome of a stupid survey. Are you messing with me, Walker? Messing with you Alan opened his eyes in surprise but immediately got annoyed. Listen, bastard. I could be relaxing at home. But no, I'm here saving the damn world because of you. Do you think I want to I was nearly killed? Phil was about to reply, but then he thought that indeed Alan had saved the world. Perhaps he should be more respectful towards him. Phil calmed down, but as he was about to apologize to Alan, he felt the speed of the bicycle increasing. Mr. Walker Phil started sweating cold. What Alan replied reluctantly. Aren't we going too fast asked Phil, pale. Dot huh. The same woman who had given Alan and Phil a hard time last time was driving on the road when suddenly something passed her at high speed, startling her and making her brake abruptly. The woman pulled out a shotgun and got out of her vehicle, confused. What the hell is going on then she opened her mouth, almost dropping her dentures, as in the distance, she saw a three-seater bicycle speeding like a Ferrari and not slowing down. Fucking city kids. Cursed the woman as she spat on the ground. Alan turned back, there was Hulk, pedaling faster and faster every second. Life is a highway. Hulk likes music. Hulk, that's enough. Alan shouted, but due to the wind, speed, the BGM, and Hulk's strident singing, his voice didn't reach the big green guy. Alan turned to Carlson. I admit that buying a single bicycle for the three of us wasn't the best idea, said Alan with a deadpan look. Fuck you, Walker, Carlson cursed. Phil wanted to strangle Alan, but as he turned forward, he yelled, Aw. 
Now what Alan heard Carlson scream in the distance. There was a cliff half a mile ahead. Shit shit shit, stop your green friend now. Phil pressed the brakes, but they didn't work. There was no way a bicycle's brakes could stop Hulk. Phil, being in the front, could turn sharply, but that would tip them over, and they would fall anyway. Hulk, you son of a... This time, Alan also lost his patience, but the muscular green guy had his eyes closed, listening to the music and didn't respond to Alan. Alan gave a dark look and turned to Phil, who looked desperate. I don't know if it's a good time to say this. But all my abilities are on cooldown, Phil. What does that mean? Alan laughed and cried, Ha ha ha, we're going to die. You're a... The bicycle shot up into the sky E.T. style. Phil screamed like a girl, Hulk continued singing while laughing, and Alan had an indifferent face as he questioned his life. I survived two apocalypses, but I'll die in such a stupid way, heh. Well, that's the story of my life. Don't worry, Hulk has an idea. Hulk interrupted. The bad ground wants to hurt Hulk's friends, so Hulk will fall first and destroy the bad ground, so Hulk's friends don't get hurt. Hulk smiled as if it were the smartest plan in the world as they lost momentum and began to fall. Carlson stayed silent. Oh my god, we're completely dead he dot he, Alan laughed dryly, denying reality. Phil grabbed him by the neck, fuck you, Walker, stop playing around. You must have some hidden card. I don't care if wings come out of your ass, just save us. As they fell to certain death, Alan's eyes lit up, and he clapped his hands with an idea. Oh, that's right, Phil, I still have my super resilient body, and I can enhance it further with cursed energy and hacky. Alan smiled brightly. Don't worry about me, I'll be fine, said Alan like a complete son of A.B. Dot I hate you with all my soul, Phil looked at Alan with empty eyes. He felt like pulling out his gun and emptying the whole magazine on the shameless Alan, but he knew that wouldn't do anything. Chapter 44, Glorious Purpose Of course, Alan was playing with Phil. He could always use his innocence to save Phil. Alan smiled and extended his hand to wrap Carlson with his crown clown, but unexpectedly, nothing happened. Huh. Alan looked at his arm and couldn't sense the existence of crown clown. Then, he had a flashback of Hulk throwing his sword away. System. The host can retrieve any system weapon from the interface no matter where it was left, but Crown Clown didn't obtain it from the system. Somewhere in Texas, there was a lonely sword buried in a rock, waiting for its master to come for it. Holy shit. Alan went pale and looked at Phil apologetically. I'll always remember you, Phil. We had some very emotional moments together, like when you danced naked and that time we happily sang on the road, and that time we fell off a cliff. Those were good times. Equals equals equals. Ha 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 ha, those were good times. This is definitely on purpose, ha ha ha. Ha ha ha, the good times with Phil are so unforgettable, it feels like it was yesterday xd. Don't be so darn mean, lmao. Equals equals equals. While Phil cursed Alan's ancestors for eight generations, another different music started playing. A-N, yeah, that was a phrase commonly used in Chinese novels, and yes, they're falling abnormally slowly xd. Is this ACDC? Alan murmured puzzled, then shook his head while smiling. Only someone as narcissistic like Stark would have their own theme music. Gentlemen, need a ride a jovial, mechanical voice came from the sky. Everyone looked up to see a flying armor of red and gold. Iron Man greeted them with a gesture and threw a net to catch the three in the air. Hulk grunted as he was caught, but Alan raised his hand, and the big green guy calmed down. Did you really tame him you truly do incredible things, kid. Iron Man spoke sarcastically and pulled the net to lower them safely. Once on the ground, Alan stood up as Tony landed. Both looked at each other in silence. Alan gave a quizzical look, and Iron Man shrugged. You didn't even try hard to pick your codename, did you playboy? Alan spoke with disdain, son of A.B. all this started because of the dumb joke. Yeah, first don't do it. I'm allergic to pain. Second, we agree that it was really obvious that I'm Playboy T-Star, Tony replied, pretending to be remorseful. He was right, his codename is simple and obviously ridiculous not to realize, 
but in the end, the internet is like that, you can name yourself Hitler if you want. Tony looked at Hulk and Phil, the latter dusting off his clothes. Rough day, Carlson. Phil smiled, not at all, Mr. Stark, just that I'd like to request an early retirement from my boss. Iron Man removed his helmet, revealing the famous Tony Stark. People already knew who he was because he shamelessly announced his secret identity, what would other heroes think, especially those from DC when they do that, it usually ends with some dead relative. I can't believe Playboy T-Star was Tony Stark. Wait. His nickname was so obvious. I feel stupid for not realizing it earlier D, Stark acts pretty familiar with Alan 3. MJ, it's normal, Playboy has been the top donor on the channel for a long time. Besides supporting Alan, he trolls him too, they should almost be friends. Equals equals equals. Tony introduced himself to Hulk, and the latter shook his hand. Hulk greets. Shield integrity at 80%, Jarvis's voice sounded as Tony gave Alan an accusatory look for not warning him about this. Alan teased Tony, Hulk needs to work on his greetings. I'm sure you'll be a good practice buddy, Tony. Yeah, enough chit chat. We need to get to the hammer to finish this mission. Phil interrupted, tired of it all. Come on, Phil, you'll get gray hairs if you stay grumpy all the time, Alan patted him on the back. Whose fault is it Carlson's forehead veins popped? Alan turned to Hulk. Hulk smashed the green man asked, not understanding why they were looking at him. No. Alan said, raising an eyebrow. Hulk thought for a moment and remembered that Alan only gave him two orders, one was to smash and the other order was. Hulk tilted his head. Hulk apologizes. Alan nodded in approval and gave Phil a thumbs up. Hulk regrets, don't be mad, Phil. Carlson cursed him internally for being so brazen. Well, Agent Carlson, I sympathize, but look at the bright side. Tony pointed to his right. We've arrived. In the distance, amidst nowhere, they could see a kind of impromptu fair. WTF. Alan couldn't believe what he was seeing. They had arrived. As the group approached, they saw people laughing, eating, and dancing. There was a greased pig catching contest, a mud fight, a shooting range, and dancing. Most absurdly, in the midst of all this, there was a long line of people trying to pull the hammer in all sorts of ways as if it were a tourist attraction. I guess that's the hammer. Tony said putting on sunglasses and standing beside Alan. It looks fun. Hulk wants to get closer. Hulk was wearing a cloak covering his green body. He was still a massive muscle mass, but the people here only glanced at him for a moment before returning to their activities. I'm not sure if it's a good idea. Tony said, worried for the people's safety. Alan also assessed the situation and decided to trust Hulk but would keep an eye on him. In a hospital, a man screamed while trying to free himself from the doctor's grasp. Get your hands off me, mortals. Thor growled as the doctors held him down on the stretcher. Administer sedatives. The doctor said calmly, sighing. I don't get paid enough to deal with these kinds of patients. Keep your sorcery away. I am a god. I am Odin's son, father of all. I am Thor, the god of thunder. I dot was Thor slowly fell asleep. I was. Odin's son, Thor. Loki walked through golden halls where various valuable and dangerous objects lay scattered around him, however, Loki ignored them and went straight to a chest emitting a faint blue light. The chest contained past winters and was the power source for the frost giants. Loki was about to take it but withdrew his hand at the last moment. Loki isn't Odin's biological son in this world. The shock of knowing this made Loki feel betrayed by Odin, along with his envy towards his brother Thor, which triggered his rage and actions that led to plotting against his brother. I don't need power from others. Said Loki as he walked away. The classic Loki could stand up to the Avengers alone. Loki. A middle-aged woman with golden hair and a crown entered the treasure room accompanied by two guards. Her face showed concern as she hurried towards Loki. Mother. Loki's cold gaze softened momentarily, though Loki already knew the reason for her concern. What's happening? She was Frigga, Odin's wife, Thor's mother, and Loki's adoptive mother. Your father has fallen into Odin's sleep, your brother has been banished, 
and someone infiltrated Asgard and killed several guards. Frigga was quick to act, ordering a search for the culprit, doubling security, and preparing for war. With Odin asleep and Thor banished, Asgard was vulnerable to attack. Are you okay? Mother Loki smiled and embraced her. His eyes showed a pain he didn't reveal when manipulating Thor to attack the Frost Giants or when betraying his father and Asgard. Loki Warehouse. Sorry, Mother, sleep. With a whisper in Frigga's ear, she fell asleep. Frigga was a sorceress in her own right, but she wasn't on guard against Loki, allowing him to easily put her into a coma. Feeling remorseful, aware of this fact, Loki carried Frigga in his arms and took her to a room. The guards didn't react to Loki's betrayal because he showed them an illusion where nothing of the sort happened. To them, the queen embraced her son, telling him to sit on the throne in Thor and Odin's absence. I was born with a great purpose. I won't let something as stupid as blood take it away from me. Loki laid his mother on a bed, gazing at her for a moment, brushing her golden hair from her face, then exited the room and walked to the throne hall. What Loki didn't know was that eyes were watching him, a red-haired, bearded dwarf, a slim, blonde man, and a beautiful woman in warrior's armor with a Valkyrie's aura. The Valkyrie was Sif, the dwarf was Val's tag, and the blonde was Fondrel, Thor's companions and friends who had accompanied him over the years in many battles. They knew that if anyone could intercede for Thor with Odin, it would be her, so they came to see her to revoke Thor's banishment. However, they didn't expect to see Loki betraying all of Asgard. Loki stood before Asgard's throne, his desire to claim it was strong, but he was more affected than he thought by turning his back on Frigga. Loki knew Odin wouldn't abandon Thor, and this banishment was only a test for him. Loki gritted his teeth, he always felt odd favoritism from Odin towards Thor, even when Thor behaved like a conceited, foolish, narcissistic, impulsive person. But after learning his origin as a frost giant and that he wasn't Odin's son, Loki felt that Odin never saw him as a son from the beginning. Loki walked while guards kneeled in his path, then walked up the golden stairs, gazing at Odin's throne for a moment, summoned his scepter, and sat down slowly. Using his magic, Loki initiated a transmission across Asgard. Asgard suffered an attack, Asgardians lost their lives, the Alfather fell into a deep sleep, and... My brother was banished due to his recklessness. Heimdall heard Loki's words, furrowing his brow, there was something suspicious about these events. Heimdall saw Sif, Val's tag, and Fondril arrive at him. The Valkyrie Sif stepped forward. Heimdall, we must bring Thor back, Loki is a traitor. Heimdall didn't hesitate and opened a portal to the world they knew as Midgard. This is all I can do as I can't leave my post. The three warriors nodded as they crossed the Bifrost Bridge. Sons and daughters of Asgard, prepare for war. Someone breached the gates of our land and tainted our sacred ground with blood. The enraged cries of Asgardians echoed everywhere. More than fear of war, the fury Loki aroused in their hearts was enough not to question his ascension to the throne. Loki reclined on the throne, it had been easier to achieve than he thought, but at the same time, there was a nagging discomfort in the depths of his subconscious, angering him. Everyone out? Loki ordered, and the guards withdrew without a word, thinking Loki must be frustrated with everything happening. Loki grabbed his hair and struck his scepter on the floor. No. The throne is my right? I'm not usurping it? Loki over the centuries believed that if he proved to be less of a son than Thor, his father would recognize him as the next king of Asgard. You would never give the throne to a giant's son. Loki stood up. What's worse is that you put someone like Thor before me. With a dark voice, Loki looked towards Earth as black and silver armor began covering him. It's all for my glorious purpose. Chapter 45, The World in Crisis The clash between Alan and Hulk was, to say the least, astonishing, and also terrifying. Unlike the time with Doomsday, people couldn't deny the reality of the event, there were two monsters capable of ending the world. On Eric's side, better known as Magneto, the reaction to Alan and Hulk's first clash was varied. From a breathless avalanche to Sabretooth declaring his eagerness to fight him. Ha ha ha, I love that destruction. I've changed my mind, let me fight Walker. You're drunk, just shut up. Mystique scolded Sabretooth irritably, then looked over to Magneto who observed the fight in silence. 
Are we just going to watch Mystique asked. Eric didn't respond. Alan was sent flying to Colorado, and Hulk's clear superiority was evident. At that moment, Magneto's face wrinkled, almost deciding to go help Alan. Eric. He's going to die. It was Avalanche who spoke, the most committed to the mutant cause. Seeing a brother so special die would be unacceptable. However, he also knew that this level of fight wasn't something he could intervene in. Only Magneto himself could support Alan. Eric fell silent as the magnetic field within several hundred meters around him began to fluctuate. For Eric, his mutant brothers and sisters were the most valuable in the world. Even if Alan wasn't his ally yet, Eric considered him invaluable. However, after seeing the result of the second confrontation and Alan showing the ability to fight Hulk on equal terms, he decided to wait. Everything seemed ridiculous with Hulk effortlessly hurling a piece of the surface towards Alan. Hey hey hey. That's dangerous Pyro exclaimed, feeling chills at the massive meteorite in the sky created by Hulk. It was large enough to cause an ice age if it hit the ground. Then Alan turned it into a mini planet where they fought again. That's impossible. Said a shocked woman with a hood that revealed her golden hair as she watched Alan's live stream. Her delicate features showed surprise beyond words, her name was Emma Frost, and strangely, she was allied with Magneto. At first, the woman underestimated the level this fight would reach. When Alan split the sky, they all fell silent without exception. In his mansion, Charles observed this with a cold sweat on his cheek. Eric, do you still want to recruit him murmured Charles, and Beast beside him growled with concern. Charles, according to my estimations, Hulk could reach a level where he could destroy the Earth very soon. Beast put his hand on the stunned Charles's shoulder. Friend, you must stop Hulk. Charles sighed, I can't. When I learned of Hulk's existence, I mistook him for a mutant like us and tried to contact him, but something prevented me from entering his mind. What Beast knew Charles's capabilities to the extent that in the near future, Professor X could control everyone in the world if he wished, however, for any telepath attempting to enter Hulk's mind, they must surpass Hulk's infinite rage. In the case of World Breaker Hulk, there was also a shield of mutated gamma energy. Something impossible for Charles Xavier. Back with Magneto, he and all his allies watched as Hulk regenerated from dust and energy, a terrifying and desperate sight. Regarding Hulk's pants, they also regenerated. Of course, this is a lie but that's how it appeared to everyone watching Hulk from their electronic devices. Hulk was naked after being disintegrated by Alan's infinite mass punch, so the system censored it by giving him pants for the viewers. An, I didn't mention Hulk's pants earlier because it would take away from the seriousness of the fight, haha. <laughs> Dot this is bad, Eric said urgently and prepared to open a wormhole to get there. This ability of Magneto isn't widely known, but it's undoubtedly one of his most useful abilities as it allows him to travel great distances rapidly. Unfortunately, this Magneto isn't yet an Omega level and hasn't succeeded in doing it even once. Damn it, muttered Eric. Magneto tried in vain and failed, only Mystique noticed what Eric was attempting while everyone was looking at the screen. Everyone's eyes were fixed at the instant before Hulk struck Alan. Unexpectedly, black line tattoos appeared on Alan's face, and Hulk was cut. Sabretooth instinctively jumped back while roaring. The group's reaction, even Magneto's, was fear. Not just them, but around the world, people's blood ran cold. Sabretooth, being a wild man unafraid of death, began sweating profusely as his claws retracted and extended repeatedly. Domain Expansion Malevolent Kitchen With Alan's words, pandemonium reached the world. The countless attacks cut through Hulk's indestructible body again and again, but despite everything, Hulk's power only grew and grew. To the point that even Alan felt pressured. In a final exchange, Alan demonstrated combat superiority, and by revealing that someone caused this, people worldwide erupted in anger. Fury contacted with the president when he discovered the cause of all this, it wasn't difficult to find the destroyed helicopters. Upon calling the White House, they quickly traced it back to Ross's battalion. The president called Ross to inform him of his dismissal and arrest. Why this is for the good of the nation. Ross yelled furiously as he was handcuffed. The president remained calm. Look around you, Thaddeus. 
The world could be destroyed because of you. People demand someone's head. And it will be my head Ross gritted his teeth. Everyone must make sacrifices for their country. Thaddeus Ross was arrested and taken by SHIELD after being interrogated, he would be imprisoned until the court martial. His battalion was disbanded and reassigned to different locations. The only thing that wasn't resolved was the existence of a secret underground laboratory which Ross would never reveal the location. The people of the world were equally amazed and frightened. To begin with, the idea of people with superpowers was too ambiguous for the general public. When you asked an ordinary person if they knew about supernatural beings, they'd imagine someone throwing fireballs from their hands. Not in their wildest dreams did they imagine seeing a fight of the magnitude Alan and Hulk had. People panicked, even when they knew the crisis had been averted. They panicked knowing that events that until now only happened in movies were happening in their world. BBC, people take to the streets to protest the security measures taken against the possible mutant threat. CNN, in international news, the world shakes with the revelation of the dark side of our world's moon, as a famous proverb says, reality surpasses fiction. On national radio, so, should we just shut up and accept that Hulk wasn't to blame for anything and that it was all the fault of a crazed military man what are people supposed to do knowing that thing is walking the streets like nothing happened? News reports, everyone hails Alan as a hero. The people's hypocrisy knows no bounds. Just a couple of days ago, social media was flooded with messages of hate and fear, congressmen were debating implementing stricter mutant laws, and now they're kissing Walker's feet. Entertainment programs, Alan Walker, that name reaches every corner of the world, regardless of language or country. A young man who dedicates himself to streaming among other media for content creation on social networks has become the most famous person in the world. His last live stream reached 3.2 million viewers at its peak. In a building owned by the renowned newspaper in NYC called The Daily Bugle, there was a Caucasian man with a brush mustache and a flat top haircut. He was sitting at his desk with a cigar in his mouth while watching the outcome of the Allen and Hulk fight on his computer. Stop the presses, we're changing the headline. Shouted the man. He's John J. Jameson Jr. the editor-in-chief of the Daily Bugle. A man entered the office. Sir, but there will be losses, we had already sent everything to print. I don't give a shit that some crazy scientist is creating a sun in New York, there's an apocalyptic threat a few states away. Jameson paused for a moment, understanding his hands. Headline, Alan Walker, hero or just a monster? Sir, isn't that a bit rushed? Nonsense. There's a hormonal disorder kid cracking jokes while having the power to destroy the fucking world. People need to be aware of the danger. While many praised Alan, others began to fear him due to his display of power. It was simply too much power for people to forget. In that sense, Jameson was right. Alan was someone difficult to hate, whether it was his personality, actions, charisma, or even his appearance. That's why many simply accepted Alan taking charge of Hulk, without thinking about the danger it represented. Alan was aware of this but didn't care. As long as Hulk saved the world a couple of times, people would stop hating and fearing him. Hulk walked cheerfully to a hot dog stand and ordered 20. Alan told the owner to give him whatever he wanted, and the man in armor would pay for it. Tony complained but eventually agreed. There was no way a billionaire like him would complain about a few dollars less, that was his mistake. When Hulk found out he could eat as much as he wanted, he grabbed the food cart and emptied it into his mouth, then moved to the next stand and did the same. Tony sweated cold seeing Hulk eat like an elephant. Ha ha ha, Stark's face, this is going straight to Twitter LMFAO. WTF, do you guys forget that Hulk almost ended the world, I know, but... He's so innocent and silly, he really doesn't seem to do it on purpose. I don't care anymore, as long as he doesn't do it again. Everyone's crazy. So, what's your plan Phil asked beside Alan. Originally, Carlson was supposed to arrive quickly at this place and cordon off the area with SHIELD agents to prevent it from becoming, well, but Fury gave Alan total authority over this operation. It was both a show of trust in him and a test to determine how reliable Alan was on a mission, so no agent moved without Alan's order. Alan watched as he ate a cheeseburger and saw the SHIELD agents ready to evacuate the people from this place. Then he looked at an old man tying the hammer with a chain to his truck. Phil, 
Do hammers grow on trees? Alan asked, finishing his meal. No. Calson responded seriously, observing Alan's expressionless gaze. Exactly, someone dropped that hammer there, and it must be blocked by some kind of magic or supernatural power that only its bearer can lift. Calson saw the crater around a hammer and thought that maybe it had fallen from space. Are you going to break the magic or something? Calson had seen Alan perform many miracles and thought maybe he had some magical way to break the spell. Alan shrugged as he walked toward the elderly man by the truck. I won't do something like that. I'll just cut all the ground around the hammer and take the piece of land away with the truck. Well, that would be a bit disappointing, but it seems like the best option, straight face. Expected something more magical well, I did. Rick, I hope it works, Hat. Nikki, MMM. Gwen, is something wrong? Gwen noticed in Alan's exclusive chat for founders and friends that Nikki was unusually quiet when she usually comments a lot Nikki, it's just that that hammer seems familiar to me. But it must be my imagination, he he. Gwen thought for a moment and looked closely at the hammer, she saw a symbol on it, took a screenshot, and began to investigate. Is it Icelandic Nordic Thursday is this? The hammer, the thorn, or the branch? The hammer refers to the god Thor. Gwen leaned back in her chair, checked her phone, and saw several missed calls, her parents must be furious because she skipped classes. She simply couldn't go with the worry Alan's situation caused her. Mary Jane approached behind Gwen and offered her a glass of water. They went through a tough time seeing Alan in danger, but now that everything was over, they were just tired. You should call them. Mary Jane said with a calm face, but her eyes changed as she thought about her parents. They tend to be overprotective, Gwen sighed. And is that bad MJ said, lowering her head with an uncomfortable look. I'm sorry, MJ. I wasn't thinking. Gwen felt stupid for forgetting MJ's situation, for Mary Jane, having overprotective parents was only an impossible dream, it was like complaining about food being cold in front of someone with an empty stomach. Mary Jane shook her head and then smiled. I'm very happy now. It's a dream to live with Alan. The redhead smiled mischievously. Plus, I have an advantage living with him. That you don't he he. Ugh, I already apologized. You don't have to be resentful, Gwen complained. Haha, <laughs> sorry, Gwen. Both girls laughed for a while before returning their attention to Alan, who was now talking to an old man while wearing a cowboy hat. Alan can be very strange sometimes, said the beautiful redhead watching Alan having fun with strangers. Gwen covered her face with one hand. That idiot. Come on, Stan Lee, you're almost there, Alan sarcastically spoke, he was in the passenger seat of the old man who was trying to move the hammer with his truck. Come on, darling. The old man shouted to his truck, I'm almost there, I'll win those hundred dollars, kid. In your dreams, old man. Alan teased. Both were betting on whether this old man could move the hammer with his truck. Chapter 46, Gwen and Mary Jane in tactical mode. Alan approached the elderly man wearing sunglasses who was trying an interesting method to move the hammer. Old man, don't you think this is cheating? Alan glanced at the crowd of people who had also tried but failed. Haha, <laughs> if there's one thing I've learned in my long life, it's that when everyone else doesn't achieve something by doing the same thing, try something different, the old man adjusted his glasses and gave Alan a look. What's the matter, kid you have little faith? My dear Betty can do the job. You named your truck Alan quickly shook his head. Alright, you win, but I bet you a hundred bucks this won't move the hammer. Deal. By the way, I'm Stan Lee. The old man offered his hand to Alan. Pleasure, I'm Alan Walker. Alan, of course, returned the greeting. Both got into Betty and started the engine amid the cheers of the people. Many thought this was cheating, but since no one could move it, it wouldn't hurt to try. Alan put on a hat and leaned out the window as Betty revved up. It doesn't seem to be working, Stan. Said Alan. Nonsense. The old man spat out the window and then turned serious. Come on, Betty, that money's for old Stan. Alan smiled enthusiastically. You're a crazy old man, don't blame me if you ruin Betty. Tony approached to see the commotion and rolled his eyes at Alan. What are you doing, kid? 
the image of Alan at the window holding his hat while the truck's wheels skidded on dry land, blowing air into the sky, was strange, but nothing compared to the hammer that didn't budge an inch. Shortly after, the rear defense broke, and Alan laughed as old Stanley took out a hundred dollars from his pocket. Take it, you little scammer. Pleasure doing business, Stan, had, Alan nodded and laughed. Alan approached within a meter of the hammer and observed it closely. Equals equals equals. How is it possible that it didn't move even a bit after being pulled by a truck, confused face, it seems stuck. It must be cursed. D, I think it might be its density, I heard that a spoonful of a neutron star weighs as much as an entire continent XDD. Rick, idiot. If something that heavy fell on Earth, there wouldn't be Earth left. Just look at the crater it left, the object itself isn't that dense. It's caused by something magical or supernatural. Although I can think of 18 ways to do the same with science sitting in my armchair. MJ, it's weird to see you answer people's doubts, Rick 137. Rick, I've been in therapy since season 7, it's something about self-improvement and avoiding suicide, maybe I'll even become kind. Not too much, something like Hitler. Mary Jane regretted asking, and Alan rolled his eyes while watching the comments, now that the apocalypse had passed, he had time. Alan activated the incognito function to prevent people from seeing him talk with the chat. How evil do you have to be to consider Hitler as someone good? Alan asked as he watched the comments go crazy with questions and comments. Alan. Shocked, Rick, according to my stupid grandson, at least Hitler cared about Germany, so I'm worse than him. Alan, you see, over a million people are watching you. Seems like it. Ha ha ha, Alan laughed. Sorry, everyone, I'd love to answer questions and chat, but you all know the situation, I need to focus. We'll do a live stream at my house just for chatting later. Ruby, wait, Alan, given the craziness you faced, people both adore and hate you a thousand times more than before. I expected it, technically, I saved the world, but at the same time, I know I've earned the resentment of many for forgiving Hulk and the fear of many because of my power. Alan grabbed his head and sighed. They may not believe me, and don't expect me to be a hero, it's not my thing. But I can at least assure them that I won't use my power against innocence. Equals equals equals. The discussion in the chat intensified, Alan didn't know that among that sea of comments were reporters, influential people, and even politicians. Gwen and MJ were stressed by the number of comments they had to review. Alan told the system to help them and activated slow mode in the chat. Alan looked up at the sky, wondering how long it would take for Crown Clown to return. Alan's original innocence was of the parasitic type, which meant he had a connection both spiritually and physically. However, this time it came in the form of equipment, which made Alan unable to summon it. Still, it posed no problem. Alan can call Crown Clown from wherever he is, and it will come. Besides, the system knows where the sword is at all times. And right now, it's streaking across the sky at the speed of sound. Looking for more options, Alan shrugged and moved two fingers of his hand. Instantly, the ground was cut into a square around the hammer. Alan learned to use Sukuna's curse technique without the need for the skills but only in a limited way. Hulk, please. Hulk was munching on popcorn, watching what Alan was doing without understanding anything. Upon hearing his name called, he roughly handed Tony his popcorn tub, covering him in popcorn in the process. Remember who paid for this Tony threw the tub on the ground, annoyed. Hulk, help. Hulk approached and tried to lift the ground. Surprisingly, it didn't move. Gah. Hulk grunted. Wait, Hulk. Alan stopped him and signaled to Carlson, who pulled out a megaphone. Attention, everyone, please evacuate the area. At first, people didn't want to and complained, so Alan bought several big screens and placed them a bit farther away, and the people agreed. Once the people were further away, Alan let Hulk try to lift the hammer with more force. Hulk's muscles bulged, and his veins stood out, but the ground only cracked while the hammer remained unmoved. Alan. Can you hear me? Gwen. Yes, it seems that's Thor's hammer, the rune on the hammer seems to reference the Norse god of thunder. Remember the story of the sword in the stone it's something similar. In that case, Hulk should be able to move it, 
he's as innocent as a child. Don't confuse being good with being worthy. All right, thanks, Gwen. Alan grabbed his head with both hands. Wait. Does this mean I won't get paid damn it? Initially, Fury offered to pay Alan in advance, but he refused, saying he wouldn't accept it until the task was completed as that would be cheating. My stupid RPG player mentality. Equals equals equals. Wait, is this about money D, you disappoint me, Alan? I thought it was a super important mission. D, oh the deception. The betrayal. Man, you deceived me. D, shut up, son of AB. I crossed the damn desert and saved the damn world for that hammer worth a hundred grand, and now it turns out I won't get paid for this. Ha ha ha. Ha ha ha, screw you, Alan. Rick, you should always charge in advance, idiot. Ha ha ha. Equals equals equals. Alan sighed and walked over to the hammer, then grabbed it. Damn. It's all because of... Alan looked at his hand stupidly as he saw the hammer lifted. Far from being happy, Alan felt depressed. Ugh, this smells like another apocalypse. While Gwen wasn't sure whether to laugh or be angry with Alan for playing in the desert, she heard someone knocking at the front door. Gwen stood up, intending to go and see, but she was stopped by a red-headed girl with a furrowed brow. Gwen, I've seen enough of Alan's content to know common cliches, and there's one where people close to the MC tend to be in danger when he's away from home. Someone else might have thought it was a joke from Mary Jane, but Gwen sharpened her gaze and started thinking like her father. Does Alan expect visitors the blonde asked. Alan visitors no. MJ quickly responded, the only visit would be Natasha, but she's on her way to New Mexico. Bills to pay Gwen asked again. Alan said they arrive next week, MJ felt more cautious as the situation got more complicated. She took a notebook from a drawer in the same RGB room and checked Alan's notes, bill payment dates, mail day, expense records, etc. MJ checked everything, and it was unnatural for Alan to receive visitors today. Gwen took a deep breath and psyched herself up. She retrieved her magic wand from her storage bag. The bag Gwen uses is similar to MJ's storage ring. Alan bought two in the system store so that Gwen and Natasha would have portable storage too. Wait here. Said the blonde girl, but she stopped in her tracks when she heard a reloading sound. She turned to see MJ with a Glock in her hand. Wednesday said I should check it before using it. The girl murmured, checking her gun. When she saw it was working fine, she nodded and then looked at Gwen, confused. What? The blonde girl shook her head, sorry, for a moment I forgot that Alan has enough weapons in his clothing drawer for a whole battalion, Gwen said, looking both amused and uncomfortable. Alan didn't need all the item cards, so he left most of them at home in case the girls needed them. Also, Wednesday only took the cards she liked for herself and left the rest. MJ returned Gwen's gaze and noticed the wand in her hand. I don't know much about HP, but I know you don't become a powerful witch in a day. Leave that and take an SMG. MJ started walking towards the door, shaking her head. I can do simple spells, that should be enough. Gwen replied, pouting but feeling ashamed inside. Her first instinct was to unconsciously grab the magic wand, though she knew how to fight very well. She also knows how to handle common weapons due to her father, so it would be more natural for Gwen to grab a weapon, not MJ. Both girls set aside their worries and walked cautiously towards the door. Wait, what's the plan MJ asked, stopping Gwen by the shoulder. A Gwen's coefficient dropped for a moment as she looked at her wand and felt the urge to use it. You. Open the door, and I'll shoot them with Wingardium Leviosa. Gwen nodded in satisfaction. Okay. MJ accepted without much thought, but as she took a step, she stopped Gwen again, more confused. What's that spell supposed to do? Gwen sighed and crossed her arms. It's literally the simplest magic from Harry Potter. Isn't Lumos also there? Well, it's the second simplest magic. Gwen looked disapprovingly at MJ. How are you going to be Alan's girlfriend if you don't know the basics? How am I supposed to know that HP geek stuff Alan loves me? MJ said, looking at Gwen with disdain. Who are you calling a geek you're an otaku who won't admit it but cries when seeing drawings die? 
Gwen retorted. You dare insult anime there are better animes than the whole Harry Potter saga put together. MJ started arguing angrily upon hearing Gwen's words and decided to attack Gwen's weak spots. Havane popped on Gwen's forehead. The girls argued pointlessly for five minutes. Then they looked at each other with defeated faces. What are we doing I'm sorry, Mary Jane, Gwen apologized, regretting her behavior. I'm sorry too, MJ smiled at Gwen. Do what I do in these cases, blame it on Alan's bad influence. Gwen chuckled, both girls made amends by blaming Alan for making them what they were now. If Alan were here, he'd object to such an injustice. Wait, can you still tell me what the spell does how am I supposed to expect or not expect if I don't know what the darn spell does MJ became nervous, Gwen won't make them explode, right just open the door, and I'll handle it, trust me, declared Gwen bravely and convincingly. Really because I feel like you're just looking for an excuse to use magic against someone, MJ said, looking at Gwen acting heroic. She didn't believe a single word from the blonde, I'm not playing, our lives could be in danger. Do you think I'd put us at risk just for the pleasure of using magic? Gwen's gaze wandered as she held her magic wand, but immediately her look became serious and fair. Of course not. MJ silently stared at Gwen. And what if I just shoot them? A more American solution couldn't exist. Strangely, it made sense. If there were a killer on the other side of the door. You dare blame me when you just want to shoot someone. Don't compare me to you, magical blonde. MJ shrugged. I just proposed an idea, I don't care how we do this. If it were a real killer, you'd both be dead already. I didn't expect anything from Alan's girlfriends, but you've disappointed me, Wednesday appeared in her human form as she looked disapprovingly at the pair of girls. MJ and Gwen realized they had acted very foolishly and hung their heads. It's a reality that people are influenced to a lesser or greater extent by the people around them. In this case, it was knowing Alan. Alan, no friend, you won't blame me for that. It doesn't matter, there's something outside you both need to see. Said Wednesday, reverting to her indifferent look, but there was a trace of unease in her tone that no one noticed. Gwen and MJ stopped playing and went out to see two wooden boxes, two meters high by one meter wide, in the hallway. Wednesday looked at the boxes from behind Gwen and MJ, it seems I'm not the only one. I wonder if this is a blessing or a curse. Chapter 47, Doro Dinson. Leaving the desert behind, Alan headed to a bar in Puente Antigua with the others. He wanted to rest after completing his task, although he technically didn't need it while on stream. The experience with Sukuna and the stress generated by the Hulk encounter were heavy burdens. Alan sat at a table with Stan Lee and left the hammer on the counter. People were excited about his achievement, but not him. Alan had been more cautious since he discovered that his world was like DC Comics. To summarize Marvel and DC Comics, there's an easy example, oops, I stubbed my toe. Boom, the universe is destroyed. Or maybe look, a harmless box in a commonplace. Boom, the universe is destroyed. Of course, that's an exaggeration, but with so many potentially dangerous things everywhere, it happens that at any moment, something could occur that puts the world at risk. Alan felt pressured and decided to have a drink. Well, it's not a solution, but being so stressed, he needed to relax somehow. Alan ordered something simple with little alcohol. However, the old Stan Lee ordered strong whiskey and began drinking non-stop, then he began telling his life story to Alan. I'm telling you, it would have been the best idea. Said Stan, ecstatic after getting drunk. A superhero with spider powers. Haha, <laughs> would he shoot webs from his mouth or his butt Alan asked, laughing. Ha ha ha, I was thinking of some web shooters, technologically or maybe organically, I don't know, Stan Lee took another big gulp and burped. That sounds interesting, would it be something like Superman? No, Spider-Man would be more human, with more weaknesses, the old man paused and adjusted his sunglasses. An ordinary kid who gains spider powers. Spider-Man. Also, he wouldn't be entirely loved like Superman or feared like Batman. He'd be like a friend, a neighbor to everyone, a superhero closer to ordinary people. MMM, but according to your story, isn't it quite cruel to make loved ones die, 
and those who don't die end up far away from him in one way or another Alan shivered, knowing the miserable life Spider-Man would have if his life were written by this old man. Fortunately, Alan has his system to avoid tragic canon events. Don't worry, host, we'll fight fire with fire, if the plot bothers you, we destroy it, that's it. System, that's very violent. Desperate measures for desperate situations. Stan fell silent for a moment and looked around the bar where everyone was drinking. People empathize more with misfortune, that's why good stories always have tragedies. Stan Lee said with a smile, looking Alan in the eyes. Alan felt uncomfortable and drank his drink before looking at the old man again, seriously. Old man, why didn't you publish it as a comic? Stan Lee grunted and then sighed. I almost did several times, but life is complicated. I had many problems that prevented me from devoting myself to creating comics, Stan added in a low voice, eventually. I opened a business and ended up abandoning my dream. Alan felt a little sorry for the old man, apart from the cruelty toward his character, his stories seemed to have a lot of potential. I think it's a good idea. Spider-Man. I don't know, I feel like I'd like him to exist. No, that would be cruel. Didn't you hear that after getting powers, he loses his uncle, the phrase the old man said about with great power comes great responsibility touched my heart. Equals equals equals. What do you say, are you interested in my story asked the old man with a mysterious smile. I'm not an artist. Haha, <laughs> I didn't mean that. Stanley laughed and then patted Alan on the shoulder. Well, I have to go, see you. Alan turned to the old man and found that he was no longer there. Old man Alan searched the entire bar and didn't see Stan Lee. Where did the old man go? He was here a second ago, but just as someone passed in front of the camera, he disappeared. D, don't tell me that all this time Stan Lee was a ghost D, equals equals equals. Alan also felt it was strange, but Batman can also do that, so he didn't take it too seriously. After a while of drinking while talking to his viewers, Alan saw Tony and Phil enter. They moved to a table. There, Tony, Bruce, Alan, and Phil sat down. Tony took off his suit and left it standing outside. Hulk ate half a ton of food, was satisfied, and was in a good mood to let Bruce Banner out. Alan got the man a plaid shirt, shoes, and pants. Bruce repeatedly thanked Alan, not only for stopping Hulk but also for helping him understand his green alter ego a little better. Bruce looked tired and disheveled but gathered the courage to speak. I always treated him as a monster. Maybe I should have accepted his existence within me from the beginning and not denied it. Banner leaned back in his chair. Dr. Banner, are you okay with this I can't imagine what it's like to be trapped in my own body. Tony commented, looking pityingly at Banner. He didn't realize that Banner and Hulk were two people, he simply thought Banner went crazy when he became Hulk. Bruce took a deep breath before continuing, it's okay. It was my fault that Hulk was born. Besides, I believe he existed long before the accident in the lab, and the gamma radiation just shaped him. Banner lowered his head and rested his face on his hands. All that anger that I never knew I had inside me nearly destroyed the world. Carlson took out a folder with photographs, showing people with different mutations in parts of their bodies. From what we know, you absorbed the gamma radiation from Ross's devices to prevent people at that restaurant from mutating completely, is that correct? Yes. But I never imagined that would happen. I didn't imagine that would happen to Hulk and I couldn't contain the gamma radiation in my body and the anger inside me. Banner banged his head against the table. I wouldn't know how to live if I had massacred people in that state. Alan noticed Bruce starting to get agitated and decided to change the subject. Bruce. Will you share conscious time asked Alan, leaning on the table. Yes. I'd like to try to get along with Hulk, instead of trying to destroy each other, Banner smiled defeatedly, not that he willingly accepted this, but he knew it was the best choice. Alan thought about what to do with Hulk and looked at Tony drinking wine. In that case, Tony might need help. Isn't that right, Iron Man? Kid, don't try to throw your shit at me. Tony sighed. Alan straightened up and mocked Tony while leaning his elbow on the table. You say that as if you don't need help, being a superhero must be very hard, right? Tony clicked his tongue, but he knew Alan was right. 
Lately, being a superhero was very difficult, the help of someone like Hulk was invaluable. All right, you win, kid. I admit it, I could use a scientist as incredible as Banner and the help of a super strong giant like Hulk. What do you say, Dr. Banner Allen turned his gaze to Bruce and to Hulk, who must have been listening. Due to the seal I put on you, no one will risk trying to arrest you, but you must make amends for your actions. Wait. Coulson interrupted. S.H.I.E.L.D. can take care of Hulk. Sure, such a good and reliable organization like S.H.I.E.L.D. should have Hulk at their disposal, Tony said sarcastically, crossing his arms. I'd rather have to pay enough food for an entire regiment than leave Hulk in their hands. Coulson frowned, feeling offended. Mr. Stark, I know your opinion of S.H.I.E.L.D. isn't the best, but we are still an organization that has done more for the world than you have. Come on, don't fight. In the end, it's Bruce and Hulk's decision, Alan intervened in the conversation while checking comments. Gwen conducted a survey, and the result was that Hulk should go with Tony. Banner remained silent. He knows that returning to his former life is impossible, people already know what Hulk is capable of. At this moment, it's thanks to Alan's lie that he can be free, but he needs to win people's favor. Bruce sighed. Stark. Do you have an extra large bed? Tony smiled. No, but I can design one sturdy enough for a Hulk. Coulson sat back down and didn't say anything else. It seems he gave up on recruiting Hulk. Alan narrowed his eyes at this. While Coulson is a simple man, he's still a veteran agent of S.H.I.E.L.D., he wouldn't back down so easily. Besides, it was even more surprising that Fury gave up on recruiting Hulk. In his office, Fury received a call from the higher UPS, who complained about not being able to recruit Hulk. Fury reassured them, saying he hadn't given up. But it wasn't true, he had been investigating some people within S.H.I.E.L.D. No one can imagine his hilarious reaction when he will discover in the future that he has aliens and Hydra members in his organization. Is it okay to leave Hulk with Stark? Maria Hill stood in front of Fury, unable to believe her boss had given in. I just believe Hulk is better off there, Fury turned while looking out the window. Maria knew the real reason behind this. Fury mistrusted several people in S.H.I.E.L.D., he wouldn't hand a weapon of mass destruction to them. Back in the bar, everyone chatted for a while. Banner talked about his experience inside Hulk, and Tony discussed the work of being a superhero and the future of Stark Industries. What do you say, kid interested in a part-time job at Stark Industries? Tony asked, waving a blank check. Alan was tempted but he had already declined to be a superhero. It's more profitable and safer to be a mercenary. Just call if you need help. Of course, you must be willing to pay, and I don't come cheap. Alan leaned back in the chair, putting his feet on the table. Seriously, still thinking about your safety even after having so much power Tony rolled his eyes, incredulous at Alan. Alan crossed his arms stubbornly. No matter my strength, I still believe in self-preservation. Whatever you say, ha ha ha, Tony got up and threw a few hundred dollars on the table to pay the bill. I'm leaving, I should be back, and I have important matters. A woman Alan looked at the cheeky Tony. Some habits never die. A date with two models, nothing special, replied Tony, then turned to Bruce. I guess we're off. Bruce stood up and nodded at Alan. Thanks again, and see you. Alan. I think Hulk will want to see you from time to time, so come visit us. Alan smiled. No problem, I'll visit often. Just as everyone was about to leave, a blonde man entered the bar, looking agitated. Mjolnir. The man shouted and ran toward the hammer on the table. Then he grabbed the hilt to lift it, but he couldn't move it. What the man exclaimed in surprise, pulling harder, to no avail. Who are you Alan asked, confused, looking at the strong built, long haired blonde man, but the man ignored him. No. It can't be. I father, why have you abandoned me the man shouted in front of everyone, and after a moment, the man knelt on the floor. You should hit him, Alan. What, a crazy person out of nowhere. This is better than a movie, something always happens xd. Alan ignored the comments, grabbed the hammer, and showed it to the man. Are you the owner? That's impossible. The man's mouth opened in shock as he looked at Alan. 
you're immortal. How can you be worthy? That mortal is my Alan Walker, show some respect. This guy gives off vibes of being very egocentric and arrogant. Mortal. What kind of sorcery did you use on my hammer you can't be worthy? The man stood up, glaring at Alan. And who are you Alan responded, annoyed by the blonde man's attitude, of course, I am Thor, son of Odin, the father of all. Prince of Asgard, god of thunder, scourge of giants. I'm Alan Walker, a content creator. That's about it, I suppose. And I'm Little Red Riding Hood, ha ha ha, Tony started laughing. What's the Norse god of lightning doing in a barfil asked with a hand on his pistol. Thor growled at everyone. It's none of your business. I just came for my hammer. Why should I give it back to you said Alan calmly. You can't even lift it. The hammer is not just a weapon, it grants the right to the throne of Asgard and the power of a god. Thor looked at the hammer and could see the inscriptions on it, the spell from his father. Alan rolled his eyes. Thor wasn't supposed to say that, saying so would make people less likely to want to return the hammer to him. Damn it. Thor pointed at Alan. It's a reality that Mjolnir is now in your hands, but I won't give up, Alan Walker, I challenge you to a duel, mortal. If you win, I'll leave, if I win, I'll reclaim Jalmir. Alan put on a blank expression. I don't know, Rick, I don't see any benefit for me in betting the hammer. Alan ignored Thor and walked away with the hammer on his shoulder. So, technically, am I the future king of Asgard? Alan was a little tipsy, and he approached the bar and then climbed onto it. Equals equals equals. Gwen, he's going to do something stupid. Isn't he Mary Jane? He definitely will. Straight face. Equals equals equals. Alan gripped the hammer firmly and addressed the crowd. As my first royal decree, I declare Fridays to be mini skirt days. The next moment, the hammer became heavy and dragged Alan to the ground. Alan was taken by surprise and fell with his face on the floor. Uh. Both the people in the bar and the viewers in the chat were speechless, except for Rick, who couldn't stop laughing. Okay. No mini skirt Fridays. The hammer became light again, and Alan was able to get up. His face was expressionless, and he didn't seem to have any injuries. While the physical damage was nothing, Alan felt embarrassed inside. Damn hammer. Host, the hammer has a will of its own. Yeah, I noticed. Couldn't you have said that earlier? What kind of joke is this Thor shouted angrily. Do you understand what it means to be the king of Asgard? Tell us, young one, what it means to be a king Stanley said from the table. At some point, that old man appeared again, and Alan looked at him suspiciously. Thor's anger calmed a bit, his eyes wandered for a moment before focusing on Alan. I. Chapter 48, Thor, Be a Worthy King Jean Grey breathed a sigh of relief upon seeing that Alan emerged victorious. She stepped away from the screen, having stood there clutching the monitor in fear. Alan had been in danger many times, and each time she felt it. Simultaneously, her chest ached as if something were burning inside her. At one point, Jean momentarily lost consciousness but regained it shortly after. I, I am glad. She sat down, gripping her face, realizing at that moment that her hands and voice trembled, and her legs were weak. Jean wasn't concerned about Alan's power, whether he was a mutant or not, she was simply terrified to see him in danger and relieved to see him safe. Jean Grey sighed as she lay on her bed with pink sheets, hugging her pillow. What a relief. What Jean didn't notice was that several things in her room were floating lightly, and when she calmed down, they slowly descended. She was a mutant but had never told anyone. In the end, her power was telekinesis, but it wasn't very powerful. Until then, she could only move things like a glass or bend a spoon. But this time, she caused many objects to float around her neighborhood. Some neighbors were alarmed and called the police. Jean smiled longingly, unaware of all that and what could happen in her future life. She only saw Alan through her phone app, relieved and happy to see him safe and well. Alan should punch the blonde guy, said the scarlet-haired girl, puffing her cheeks in anger. Alan walked up to Thor and offered him the hammer. Thor Odinson, I don't know you, but I believe this hammer is better off in your hands. The hammer is incredible, 
but it has a flaw called a moral compass, constantly demanding that you be and act in a certain way. Are you giving up the hammer? Yes, no matter if I'm capable of lifting it, I have my life on earth, and I couldn't go off to who knows where to be a king. Alan smiled, thinking he wasn't willing to take on such a big responsibility. Besides, he had already gained benefits. Host, I've finished crystallizing the fragments of destiny, I managed to create 30 in total. What how can there be so many fragments Alan nearly cursed aloud upon hearing the quantity. Thor's hammer connects with a vast number of different destinies across the present, past, and future. 30 is the minimum. Alan nearly stumbled, the hammer equated to stopping two world breaker hulks. As Alan lost balance, Thor tried to hold the hammer he was offered, but the same thing happened to him, Thor fell to the ground and broke his nose. Ha! Huh. I'm not worthy. Thor remembered the words spoken by old Stan a moment ago. What is a king Thor had known for a long time that that could be his position someday as the heir prince. Many years passed, and Thor simply assumed he would be the king of Asgard, never considering another possibility. But now he had lost that right, or perhaps it was never a right to begin with. Thor slowly got up and looked at Stan Lee, then at Alan. A king must understand the responsibility and weight of your position. Thor felt rage and helplessness. A king must understand that his casual words carry great weight for anyone who hears him. Thor paused and remembered his actions up to now, and he calmed down. Then he sighed and put aside his anger and frustration. A king must understand that people will follow each of his orders with their lives and that an order can cause a tragedy. Thor had seen his father over the years and many times disagreed with his actions. Father, why do you allow them to insult you? What should I do, Thor, kill them all? You must understand that every decision you make affects many people. Thor looked at Njalnir. You must put your people before your ego and pride. Thor remembered the moment before being banished. Thor, by my father and my father's father, I strip you of your powers and banish you from Asgard. You must make difficult decisions even if it's painful. Thor looked at Alan, this time there were no negative emotions, just a contemplative look. You must be strong, capable, skilled, tolerant, resourceful, brave but cautious, kind but firm. Uphold your ideals but accept other ways of thinking. Thor paused and smiled, remembering his brother and the times they fought, his mother, and his father. There will be times you have to swallow a bitter pill, but you must endure it for all whom you love. You're not worthy of the throne. I'm sorry, father, I've failed you and forced you to say those words. Thor looked toward the ceiling as if expecting Odin to hear him you should not show weakness or fear no matter how much you have, because people are watching you at all times and they take you as much an example as their pillar. Thor added, you must guide people with wisdom, many are following every step you take, even amid hell. Perhaps Odin couldn't hear those words, but Heimdall could, and he smiled. Thor turned to Alan, who had remained silent all this time. Alan Walker, the hammer belongs to you even with your flaws, you're more worthy than I am. Thor turned around and left the bar. Alan looked at the back of the former thunder god, shook his head, and sighed. He glanced at everyone and followed after him. Not far away, Alan found Thor leaning against a lamp post, then sliding down to the ground and sitting there. Today Thor was banished to an unknown land, today he experienced weakness for the first time. Today he experienced what it's like to be tired, the vulnerability of being able to die, the fragility of an ordinary man, and the helplessness of a mortal. Thor remained silent as the sun set in the distance, his gaze seeming downcast but strangely at peace. I always thought I was indispensable, since my birth, my role in Asgard was already written, and that Thor, the god of thunder, is irreplaceable, Thor glanced at Alan sideways, the god of thunder is irreplaceable and necessary. But it doesn't have to be me. Thor's gaze drifted to the horizon. At some point, I began to believe that everything revolved around me and that I had the right to question my father's decisions. There were times I even felt that I was right above everyone. Your father had a lot of patience, I suppose, Alan placed his hands behind his head and looked at the sunset. Haha, <laughs> he did for a long time. I don't blame my father. I nearly started a war because of my ego, at that moment, I only thought of myself and what I believed was honor, risking the lives of all Asgardians. I will look for another way. 
That's it Alan frowned, asking. You are worthy of Mjolnir, you will do better than me. Thor weakly smiled. Alan got upset. Thor, why are you acting like everything's over you made a mistake, it's done, correct it? It's not that easy, Thor replied, covering his eyes with one hand. Mjolnir no longer approves of me. Buddy, you've already done half by realizing your mistakes. Alan grabbed the hammer in front of him. Alan could sense the power he could use with the hammer if he wanted, but it wasn't something he needed. You just have to become worthy again. Even if I achieve it, my father banished me, Thor smiled self-critically. Alan firmly patted Thor's shoulder. Then prove to him that you deserve to be there again. I. Stop acting like the world is ending. You're still alive. Alan looked up at the sky and stretched his arms out. Can you feel the wind the sunset's light life goes on, and you're alive, Thor Odinson. Just become a worthy Thor again and go apologize to your father. Alan lowered his arms and looked at the stars that began to appear. You might regret it if you don't. Alan. Alan turned with a mocking smile. Quiet down. No matter how long it takes or how hard it is, if you're the true Thor, you'll make it. Thor opened his eyes and laughed. I see ha ha ha. You truly deserve the hammer. No, friend, I already have my faithful companion, and I don't want to be an alien king. In the nearly night sky, a light shone, Alan felt his innocence close by, a smile drawn on his face. It's here. Alan extended his left hand to grab Crown Saber, approaching at great speed, as the night was illuminated by the radiance of innocence. However, as Alan prepared to grasp his innocence, it accelerated even more as it approached. A confused, Alan watched this event. Crown. Before it could finish its sentence, the sword passed by him and landed with an explosion on the ground. Alan robotically turned, his innocence cut his cheek. On the ground lay a wide blade sword with a faint glow, having created a small crater upon landing. Was it my imagination for a moment, Alan felt hostility from his innocence. But now it was just there. Alan closed his eyes and checked the connection, it was the same as always. It's most likely jealousy. Wednesday appeared on Alan's shoulder. From her point of view, she was thrown somewhere unknown, and her master didn't look for her. Then she returns and finds you cheating on her with a hammer, she must be very angry. Don't say it as if it were a wife finding her husband with a lover, Alan coughed, choking, then composed himself and walked toward the sword. As he touched Crown Saber's hilt with his left hand, the sword immediately turned into a glove and then disappeared. Alan decided not to dwell too much, too many strange things had happened today for him to start wondering if his innocence was jealous of Mjolnir. By the way, what are you doing here, Wednesday? There's a small matter you should handle at your apartment. Wednesday paused momentarily. It's related to two human-sized boxes that arrived at your apartment. Alan froze in place and felt a shiver down his spine. Don't tell me. If another sex doll had arrived and it would be normal, Wednesday wouldn't bother coming just to warn him. The only detail was that within the list of sex dolls, some would be very dangerous, and that gave Alan the chills. Equals equals equals. All the abilities that Alan obtained from the Crimson Chest had not yet been specifically explained. Crimson Chest obtained by Alan Walker. Not all content in the Crimson Chest is of Crimson Rank. Crimson Rank Curse Technique. Disassemble Kai, default slashing attack usually used for inanimate objects, but can also be used against opponents with great effectiveness. Cleave Haki, a slashing attack that adjusts depending on the hardness of the target and the level of cursed energy to eliminate it in a single strike. Alan can use Disassemble and Cleave without the skill being active due to his training with Sukuna. Conditional physical enhancement at the level of the King of Curses, immense strength, immense reflexes, immense speed, immense durability, requires cursed energy. Conditional abilities require certain conditions to be met, in the case of the ones mentioned earlier, it requires Alan to use cursed energy. Permanent immense cursed energy at the level of the King of Curses, Ryam and Sukuna had a massive amount of cursed energy, twice that of the Jujutsu Sorcerer with the most cursed energy. Malevolent Kitchen Shrine Fukuma Mizashi, Domain Expansion Creating a Buddhist Sanctuary. Malevolent Shrine has a unique feature, it doesn't create a separate space using a barrier, used for 2 hours every 3 days. 
Domain Amplification Ryoiki 10N, amplifies cursed energy into an aura containing your domain. Sukuna used this technique to neutralize Satoru Gojo's unlimited technique and be able to have physical contact with him. Used for 2 hours every 3 days, Chapter 49, Artoria Pendragon. Hey, are you alright Thor approached when he noticed Alan turning pale. I'm okay. Alan lied, he was worried. There were valid reasons for his concern. Among the array of waifus, many were dangerous, some uncontrollable, a few even posed a threat just by existing, and some remained unpredictable. If it's her. I'm in trouble. Oh my god, if she arrives or her maybe her. Calm down, host, even if you don't like it, remember they can't harm you or disobey you. The system's words didn't assuage Alan's worries. Despite Wednesday being peculiar, she was still just a normal girl. But what if one of them was so powerful that they could disobey him Alan took a deep breath and exhaled. Wednesday, what's your take on them? Alan couldn't return immediately, he needed information. I don't sense hostility or danger from them, and both are fast asleep. I deduce it's because you're not close, and they can't draw enough vitality from you to awaken. System I've established a connection with them. Would you like to bring them into your inventory? Yes, even if they're asleep, I'd prefer them not to be near my Aunt Nat, MJ, and Gwen until I ascertain their personalities. Understood. Alan felt a connection with two new entities. He also sensed his vitality draining but activated the reverse technique to immediately restore it. It was akin to refilling a water tank, they would deplete his vitality until there was enough to awaken them. One of them is like Wednesday, so she shouldn't be much different from a normal girl. But the other one requires an enormous amount of vitality. If I didn't have the reverse technique and vitality boosts from the chests, I would have fainted by now. Alan acquired various limited use abilities, alongside permanent power upgrades. The endurance inherited from the old Shirehage was a permanent enhancement, granting Alan monstrous vitality. He also possessed immense physical strength derived from Sukuna, part of the abilities of the Crimson Set, also a permanent upgrade, albeit demanding cursed energy. However, Alan suddenly felt as if he were being drained by one of the two sex dolls, resembling an endless pit. Alan was now certain that it was one of the powerful waifus on the list. But he was also relieved because he didn't sense hostility from her, for now, at least. Inside the inventory were two figures shrouded in darkness, they seemed lifeless, but gradually a glow enveloped them, and two hearts beat strongly. Alan decided not to disturb them and focused on the present. However, Alan was in a tricky situation, he had been asked to carry the hammer, but what was he supposed to do now firstly, it was useless in someone else's hands, and secondly, he didn't feel comfortable just giving it away. Alan sighed. I guess I should have given up on the hundred thousand, host, I didn't have the chance to tell you before, but you should check your interface and statistics. Alan didn't overthink and proceeded to do so. Plus 3,798,000. Alan remained motionless for a minute, even the people in the chat began to worry. Then, he erupted into laughter. His laughter was so uproarious that tears streamed down his face. Thor glanced at Alan, bewildered, the chat didn't comprehend what was happening, some even suggested that Alan had lost his mind. All this time, I was worried about a hundred thousand when I forgot that my main source of credits is my viewers. Ha 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 keep in mind that each credit can be exchanged for a real dollar. Alan shook his head and grinned at his viewers. Thank you all for watching me. After expressing his gratitude, Alan turned towards the sky, a moment ago, it was dusk, and it had darkened while he was talking to Thor. Alan decided to extend his stay for one more day, after all, he had permission. Tony arranged for a helicopter and departed with Bruce. Phil also stayed, technically, his mission hadn't concluded, although Alan wasn't going to relinquish the hammer, and Phil sensed that. Moreover, at this point, who could force Alan to do anything Thor was the most intriguing, a scientist who had come in search of him. It appeared that Thor had made a couple of friends upon arriving on Earth. Alan refrained from interfering and gave them space, Thor mentioned that he intended to remain in Puente Antiguo until he determined his next course of action. Alan concluded the live stream after 13 hours of broadcasting, he pledged to host a shorter and more relaxed stream the following day. 30 minutes later, 
Natasha arrived escorted by some S.H.I.E.L.D. agents. Alan anticipated being scolded by her, so he accepted his fate. Surprisingly, the red-haired woman just hugged him for quite some time. Alan found himself apologizing several times before receiving a brief response from Natasha. The system proved to be quite capable. Alan sought a place to stay, but the system advised it wasn't necessary and instructed him to locate an empty plot. Alan complied and chose a location near the road, the system worked its magic. Host, don't assume I can only modify a computer and record. In Alan's vision, an entire building was gradually taking shape. It wasn't just any building, it was his building. Alan was amazed. The system could create all the conditions required for content creation, including a comfortable and secure location anywhere and the capability to broadcast under any conditions. Yes, that meant the system could fabricate a shelter on the moon for Alan to live stream from there. Natasha was equally astounded. They both entered the building and ascended to Alan's floor, only to discover a replica of his apartment in NYC. Alan traversed the familiar space, the lights and water were functional despite the building's detachment from any such services, I'm impressed. Host, it's merely part of my functions as the absolute content creation system, and there's still more for you to witness. Oh, like what? Tomorrow, host a live stream from your room, and I'll show you. All right, deal, ha ha ha. Alan contacted MJ and Gwen to inform them of his extended stay. The girls were discontent, prompting Alan to kill two birds with one stone, he procured two pendants with defensive functionalities from the system store and utilized a fate fragment on each to enhance them. White Rose defensive collar, blue grade, provides the ability to teleport at will, has an automatic teleport function in case of mortal danger, limit of use five times per day. The other collar was Aiken, except it bore a hummingbird emblem instead of a white rose. Satisfied after employing two fragments, Alan acknowledged that the store-bought collar was a one-time use and disposable, this was better. Now that Alan had accumulated numerous fragments and a considerable sum of credits, increasing every second, he contemplated whether to upgrade the system store. Ultimately, it seemed the most fitting choice. Alan entrusted the collars to Wednesday for delivery. As for why Wednesday could also teleport to his apartment at will, that remained a mystery, but she could do so in places she had visited and where Alan was present. Alan also wanted to gift Natasha a pendant, but she declined and pointed to another item in the holographic store display. And Nat, that. Alan began to sweat as she indicated a ring, which, unlike the one he gave MJ, served a different purpose. Promise ring, green grade, a beautiful ring that forms a spiritual connection between two people, allowing them to know each other's location even when apart, and also their health status. Ha ha ha, don't worry, it's just a little punishment for making me worry, Natasha teased as she hugged Alan from behind. Alan chuckled awkwardly, he didn't mind gifting Natasha a ring, but being constantly tracked felt uncomfortable. Ultimately, he purchased a pendant for Natasha and utilized a fate fragment as well. He took a shower with the redhead, and although their interaction didn't exceed boundaries previously crossed, there was an intimate connection in the shower with the beautiful Natasha. Eventually, they slept together, Alan lay with a naked woman atop him. In the past, Alan would not be able to sleep under these circumstances, but now that they had established an intimate connection, he could finally relax. Alan glanced at the hammer on a shelf in the room and then gazed at the night sky through the window. Well, it appears there wasn't another apocalypse because of the hammer. Alan had been on edge ever since the mention of gods, but ultimately, nothing significant occurred. Simultaneously, he harbored another concern as he sensed the breathing in his inventory intensifying, the new sex dolls would awaken very soon. Alan remained uncomfortable with the fact that they were unfortunate enough to reincarnate as sex dolls rather than at least as regular dolls. While they possessed the ability to transform into various types of dolls like Wednesday, it didn't alter the fact that their original form was that of sex dolls. Alan closed his eyes and delved into his deep subconscious, where memories of a distant past resided. Artoria's POV. Was I mistaken I accepted the sword I thought I would never touch again from the hands of my most loyal knight, my final knight. Bedivere, I bear witness that you fulfilled your duty to your king. Your actions have indeed saved someone. Did I fail? No, I merely acknowledge defeat, even now, 
I don't believe my actions and ideals were wrong. Master of Chaldea, move forward with what you consider right. With that, I stood alone atop my ideals, awaiting disappearance alongside the singularity. From start to finish, I remained an imperfect king, it seemed that regardless of the path I took, I would never achieve my purpose. It was expected, in the end, I was fashioned by Merlin to be an ideal king, but that's not something that can be manufactured. I ascended to divinity, and yet here I am once more in a crumbling castle. However, I have no regrets. My ideals were not wrong. It was the only way to save humanity. Although I hope they find a better path. I beheld the light for the last time as I leaned on Excalibur. Indeed, it had been far too long since it had been in my grasp, a sword I once desired, then despised, then forgot, and once more found in my hands. It's been a lengthy journey. I'm grateful each of my knights lived and perished for their beliefs. I closed my eyes as everything faded into darkness. It's peculiar. Why haven't I disappeared I'm an existence that should have never existed? A path Artoria Pendragon never traversed, so why am I still here there's a glimmer in the distance. Is it Salomon's doing no there's no way that bastard would possess such essence. Wait, who are you when the glimmer vanished, I found myself in a peculiar room, where a white haired boy was sketching a dragon in a notebook. Instinctively, I attempted to discern the boy's character, but something obstructed my view, it was akin to a barrier preventing me from perceiving his soul. I silently regarded the boy, who appeared indifferent to my presence. You called me it had been a long while since I initiated a conversation with anyone else. Even if I reclaimed Excalibur. I wouldn't revert to who I was before, I was no longer the naive king. Is my presence so easily overlooked by a child? The boy didn't reply, in fact, he didn't even turn to acknowledge me. He simply continued sketching. Although I couldn't sense hostility, I couldn't rule out the possibility of a trap. Boy. This time, I raised my voice. I didn't expect a response, but the boy looked at me quizzically, as if just realizing my presence, and smiled. I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention, big sister. His clear gaze met mine, or rather, it seemed to pierce through me, it was an unfamiliar sensation. In this boy, I sensed a lengthy journey. Nearly as extensive as mine and riddled with darkness and sorrow, it reminded me of the centuries and centuries I wandered the world. Yet, unlike me, he never faltered. He never lost his essence. How long had it been since I felt envy and frustration towards someone I it's no problem, it was my fault for arriving unannounced. My voice wavered momentarily, even if I couldn't discern his soul, I could feel it. When did I become breathless due to carelessness when did my demeanor change in such a way if this boy had been part of the selection ritual, I would have personally brought him in. No, why am I even considering this it doesn't matter. What's your name, little one my voice unintentionally softened, eliciting a strange feeling. Nonetheless, his name held no significance. I should be inquiring about the place or why I'm here, not his identity. Alan. And you, sister he responded in his sweet voice. I am. The go. The key. I'm Arturia. I didn't know how to respond and simply stated my old name. What's happening to me pleasure to meet you, the boy stood and approached me, then bowed courteously. I made my silver armor vanish, revealing a blue dress with a neckline I couldn't recall wearing. Then, I greeted with both hands on my dress, as noble etiquette dictated. Why am I doing this my breath quickened, I was succumbing to the atmosphere. I glanced back at Alan with the intention of sternly questioning him, but his gaze was too pure to exhibit hostility, prompting me to calm down. I sat with him and engaged in conversation. How long had it been since I ceased to be a king or a goddess it doesn't matter anymore, everything was obliterated, and I shouldn't exist. And POV. The next morning, Alan awoke feeling as though he'd experienced an extensive and comforting dream. He couldn't recall the specifics of the dream, so he got up, took a shower, and prepared breakfast for himself and his redhead. After a peaceful breakfast, Alan entered his room to commence a brief live stream before contemplating his return home. Chapter 50, Rebecca Edge Runners. Alan sat in his black chair in front of his PC. It was a very comfortable replica of his original chair, in fact, his chair was a bit worn out in the upper right corner and on the seat, 
while this one was completely new. It's even better than my chair. Alan felt ripped off. He'd asked the system to renew all his furniture when he returned. Alan had called Gwen and MJ in advance. Since it was Saturday, they had no problem being present for this live stream. His aunt Natasha would also join from her phone. The screens lit up, and a camera from the system deployed in the room. The image quality of the system was infinite, well, not really, but it was many times better than any currently available. That's why Alan no longer used his normal equipment to stream, but rather the system. Alan took a breath and started the live stream. Slowly, people began to join during the intro screen. Intro screens were mostly to give people time to join before starting to talk. Interestingly, Alan's intro was an AMV of his fight against Doomsday. Now that I think about it, Alan took out his phone and searched for a clip he saw yesterday. As he was at the bar, he didn't pay much attention to it at the time, but it seemed to have gone viral very quickly. Here it is. The clip was of his fight with Hulk, edited to only show the most interesting parts and accompanied by Nefex music. The clip crossed 30 million views in less than a day. It was so popular that many celebrities shared it on their social media. Alan sighed. In a week, he had grown too much, to the point where it seemed unreal, but strangely, it made sense. Alan's content was unique and irreplicable, not to mention how quickly news spread when it involved world destruction. In that regard, the UN would convene to discuss mutant-related issues, again. Many were expectant, and although the UN was often called useless, the fact of facing possible global destruction put them to work harder than ever. At the same time, powerful mutants like Magneto began to move. It's unknown if extreme measures will be taken to control mutants, but they want to be prepared. Alan pushed his mind away from the news and greeted everyone in the chat without turning on the camera yet. Hi, everyone. Expecting a lot of people today, and as I promised, there'll be a round of questions before a live stream where I'll show you a new capability of my abilities. That last part was halfway a lie because Alan himself didn't know what his system would do yet. 130k viewers and rapidly increasing, with yesterday's news, several million more are expected. Automatic translation to all languages activated. Alright, I need to prepare for having a lot of people on live. Alan mentally prepared himself and took several breaths. 230k viewers. Seeing that number, Alan formally started the live stream and set the camera to broadcast mode. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I say this because I have people from all over the world. Alan thought for a moment. It's true, your messages will be automatically translated, and you'll hear me in your native language, so don't worry. Alan, before more people arrive and my comment gets lost, I want to know something. Is yesterday's Thor really a god? I don't know if Thor is a god or how close the similarities are with myths and legends, but the hammer is real. Alan stood up from his chair and walked to the window, then called for the hammer, and it floated to him from the shelf. Alan grabbed it and pointed it toward the sky. Alan smiled confidently. People from New Mexico, you know what to do. Record the sky and don't stop recording. Storm clouds appeared everywhere across New Mexico, the sounds of thunder alerted everyone in the state. It was terrifying yet astonishing. After a minute, the clouds dissipated, leaving the sky clear. Alan closed his window and returned. All right, there must be many videos of this on social media. I don't know how much of a god Thor or his father is, but the hammer is quite powerful, in my opinion. Alan smiled, but it made many people shiver. Next question, continued Alan, not allowing them to recover from the shock. Alan, tell me, what's your goal? It's a vague question. If you mean whether I'm going to conquer the world, the answer is no. Alan thought for a moment and put on a serious face. I'm not a hero, nor do I consider myself a villain. I don't want to hurt people who don't harm me, but don't expect me to tolerate people who want to hurt me. I don't want to rule anything or destroy any place. In general, I live and will live tomorrow like a normal person, as long as circumstances allow me. Mr. Walker, being as powerful as you are, why do you do live streams? Alan nodded at that good question. Well, because I enjoy it. Even before having abilities, I used to do this, it's part of me. Why do you seem so obsessed with money haha? 
My oldest followers can answer that. Alan responded with a dark smile. Alan accidentally bought a hundred Rosen Maiden sex dolls and doesn't know how to pay for them. Ha 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 ha. Ha ha. Banned for half an hour. D. Sorry, but what is your power? Well, I won't say much, there are bad people who would use that knowledge against me. Alan considered for a moment. My powers are what you can see. I gain abilities, powers, objects, and other things from anime, games, movies. But certain conditions have to be met to use them. Alan, are you a mutant who knows, everyone says that, so I assume I am, but honestly, I have no idea. Alan felt that the mutant identity was very convenient to explain his power. Alan, are you human? Yes, as far as I know. Alan, why are you so beautiful red heart? Thank you. I suppose, I don't think I'm at that level, and the correct term is good looking, besides, I was born this way. Alan responded, slightly dazed. Do you have a girlfriend? Yes. Although he doubted it, Alan decided to say it. No. The whining of hundreds of thousands of women around the world was heard. Would you consider yourself a Democrat or Republican? Alan squinted as he looked at that question, it seemed to come from some politician. I don't plan to get involved in politics. Would you be interested in working for the government? Alan mockingly smiled. I don't want to end up in a laboratory locked up, and I don't want to be a weapon for anyone. Alan, what do you think of Emma Watson? What about her? Alan asked, confused, as the conversation suddenly changed topics. She posted several tweets saying she fell in love with you. Ooh, ooh. Well, she's a very beautiful girl. Alan coughed a bit at seeing the pseudonym of the person who asked the question, but as I said, I have a girlfriend, I am not EW. I am not EW, MMM, what if she didn't mind sharing? Megan F., I have the same question to Red Heart. Gwen, please refrain from asking very personal questions. Or I'll have to ban you for life. But what, the moderator got mad. MJ, no complaints. Alan knew that these types of comments bothered Gwen and MJ, so he decided to end it. Okay, we're getting off topic here, we'll end the questions here and move on to trying something interesting. Alright, system, start. Alan smiled, waiting for something to happen on his screen, but it didn't. A light blinded him, and he felt like he was taken to another place. What? Alan reacted, and the first thing he saw was two soldiers in front of him. One was entirely normal with a generic face, but the other had unique and familiar features he wore a skull mask that concealed his face. He didn't react to Alan's surprise, instead, he returned the stare silently for a moment before turning away. Ghost Alan called, astonished. This time the man glanced back at him and simply nodded in greeting. The rear door of the plane they were on opened, and Ghost, along with the unknown soldier, stood up from their seats and walked towards it. I'm on a plane. Alan found this strangely familiar, he heard radio instructions and warnings. We're entering a hostile zone. Prepare for deployment. Hostile zone Alan stood up, not knowing what was happening, and noticed he was wearing a soldier's uniform and military gear. Let's go, kid, you'll be fine. Just follow me, and I'll take you back home. The soldier pulled Alan toward the edge of the plane. I think there's a mistake here. Alan tried to understand the situation. What's happening, everything changed, don't tell me we're in DC. Zero, he is ghost, confused face, the viewers were confused too, this happened too quickly. Equals equals equals. Move. Ignoring Alan's complaints, the soldier pushed him out of the plane. Alan didn't know what was going on, but he saw a huge city below and, incredibly, many people jumping from different planes simultaneously. Alan fell rapidly, and the first thing he thought was to use his ability to boost and fall using cursed energy to stop his fall. However, he realized he couldn't use any abilities or powers. What the hell? Host, I see you're worried. Do you wish to cancel the maximum experience mode? System what's going on? The support system includes the ability to enter each form of transmitted entertainment. There's no better entertainment than experiencing it firsthand, even though your current body is virtual, and the place you're in is the video game war zone. Alan was relieved to know he hadn't been sent to another world. So, 
I'm inside a virtual world like Sao or Matrix, okay. After literally facing two apocalypses, Alan's mind had strengthened even more. Although surprised quickly, he accepted it. The system said he would experience a journey in different modes of entertainment with system support. They'd be quick, more like a sample of what the system can do. Alan opened his parachute and aimed for a building. What are you doing, newbie you want to get killed? The soldier seemed confident, so Alan thought to land with him. Okay, no. Obviously, Alan had Ghost in his squadron to choose to follow, even if you know nothing about the Call of Duty series, you should recognize the soldier with a skull mask. Now, follow the super experienced soldier or an overconfident random guy the answer is none. Alan aimed for a building far from the soldier and Ghost. The reason Alan saw Ghost fall onto an enemy, cut their neck, then threw that knife at another, killing them, and finally knocked the last one to the ground, doing who knows what to him, but he didn't get up again. War is cruel. Warzone looks so realistic, or is it just me d, god, that was intense, and it censored d, equals equals equals. The other soldier landed on a building with relatively good loot and weapons, but as soon as he grabbed a gun on the roof, he stepped on a mine and exploded. As I said, war is cruel. To clarify, the soldiers aren't NPCs, they're normal Warzone players, but due to the system, their characters seem and act more real from Alan's perspective. Alan observed this from his parachute, the difference between a pro and a noob was so big that you could curse any game's ranking system because it didn't care about screwing players over. Just put yourself in the player's situation with the ghost skin having to face three-man squads to ascend in the rankings, and failing because his teammates were less useful than a sponge. No, I'm not a sponge. Alan landed on a rooftop and began opening crates containing weapons, money, grenades, drones, armor plates, perks, and kill streaks. After a minute, he exited a building with an MP5 and $3,000. Ghost emerged from a house dragging a dead guy. Okay, this is too realistic. Equals equals equals. What the fuck? Can you enter video games? OMG, this will be epic. Wait, get into Fortnite? Equals equals equals. Out of nowhere, a grenade fell at Alan's feet. Hey. Alan jumped and hurried into a house as fast as possible. However, he found himself face to face with an entire squad aiming their guns at him. Gents, Alan greeted courteously the group pointing guns at him. Kill him. I'll take them down with me. Shouted Alan, responding as the enemy fired. Alan had no abilities in this virtual world that someone else didn't have, so he could only shoot a little before falling to the ground from the hail of bullets. The enemy squad didn't kill him immediately. In Warzone, you can execute a person on the ground, but it takes a bit of time, usually, it's rare to do so. Alan found himself in a tricky situation, surrounded by a squad while one was about to execute him. Well, I'm dead. No matter, I still have the Gulag, Alan said, shrugging. In Warzone, you don't die directly, there's something called the Gulag, a one-on-one -on -one fight against another player who has also been killed. The winner returns to the map. However, when Alan expected to be executed, a flash grenade entered through the window, dazzling everyone. Hey hey hey, little shit. That nice guy there is my master. A girl's voice entered everyone's ears. She entered through the window and stepped on the first player's face, then used a shotgun to blow his head off while laughing. Ya ha ha ha. Then, the other two reacted and started shooting, but she deployed a portable shield on the floor and threw a grenade from behind it. WH Allen yelled and leaped out the window. Ha ha ha. Gunshots and the laughter of a crazy girl were heard from the second floor. Allen lay on the ground without moving as he witnessed all this. Behind him, Ghost arrived and remained silent. Shortly after, the shot stopped, and from the second floor, she jumped down and landed in front of Alan. She had a wild smile on her face, which immediately softened when she looked at Alan. She's one of the new sex dolls called Rebecca from the cyberpunk edge runners world. Rebecca is short, with soft, and cute features. Her very pale skin contrasts with the pink tattoos on her neck, abdomen, and right thigh. Her attire is unusual, she wears some sort of black bikini, and over it, a large black kitsch jacket with green details that go down past her waist, 
plus a matching pair of sneakers. Rebecca ties her light green hair into two ponytails with a band, she's not dressed for war, yet she showed her prowess with weapons. In cyberpunk, it's common for people to get cybernetic modifications called cyberware. In her, it's subtle, and her cyber optics that give her eyes a pink and yellow color are her most prominent features. The cute yet wild girl appeared like a tornado, with a chaotic and bold personality. She looked at Alan for a moment before smiling, You're very cute, I want to fuck you, said Rebecca shamelessly. She holds nothing back and isn't afraid to express her desires, unlike Wednesday, who prefers to ignore her emotions.